Hey folks, so in this video I'm going to go over a few things related to Warlock tanking in Phase 3. So if you've come here from the video that I posted on my main channel regarding Warlock leveling, then you're probably here to look at pre-raid bested slot stuff or gear that you should focus on while leveling up, and that is one thing that we'll be talking about here, but there are a few other things that I'll be covering in this video, whether you want to stick around for that or not, that's up to you. For starters, as you can see here and in the other tabs that I have open, I have multiple different builds that we're going to be aiming for at level 50. So obviously in my previous video, I talked about what you're going to want to run when you're leveling up, like what you start with at 40 and how you spend those points. But obviously things are a lot more flexible when we have access to the full level 50 talent points. And obviously this is going to be considering that you have all the runes unlocked, whereas you can't really expect to get everything immediately while leveling. So you want something that's more grounded in what we currently have. So I'll be talking about that towards the end of the video, along with some updates to like end game once you've raided Sunken Temple full best in slot lists. As we can see over here, I've got a bunch put together because I put out a pretty long video, four hour phase three Warlock deep dive. You can check that. I'll put it in the description if you have not seen it already. If you have seen it already, then this video will basically go over a lot of the stuff that has changed since I made that video. And I still think, you know, that'll be helpful to anybody who has not watched it yet. I go into excruciating detail on what the new runes are, what the builds we're going to be running are, and not a lot of that has changed. This will just kind of be reaffirming a lot of what I said with some very minor tweaks, but I'm not going to be sitting down and explaining, these are the six runes, these are the things that they do. If you want that, there's the four hour deep dive video. And if you want a very, very, very comprehensive overview of all of the new items that we can consider for gearing, that video covers it. In this video, I'm just going to talk about what has changed. What are the items that I mentioned in that video that have gotten like reworked stats or in some cases, brand new items entirely that were recently added on like the very last build before phase three goes live. And some of them are actually pretty spicy and will make significant adjustments to what we run for best in slot. So that's why I'm doing this video. Now, first, something that I decided not to cover in my main channel video is just what gear you're going to want to run while leveling, effectively while you start the leveling process. Because I figure that most people who are watching a generic leveling guide, they're not interested in, hey, here's best in slot from phase two, run that. It is somewhat self-explanatory, but for people maybe who are already phase two best in slot and are just kind of wondering what gear I'm going to be picking and choosing as I level up and go through the dungeons, I wanted to at least cover that here. So I actually do not currently have Dryad's Wrist Bindings, but this is something that you can now very easily farm on your own because Ashen Veil, the 1000 rep quest is now a daily instead of a weekly. So I'm like eight days away I'm not going to have it in time for my guild's very first Sunken Temple run, but I'll at least get it relatively soon, which is nice. And everybody should be doing that every single day because these bracers are very good. Now, uh, there's something I'll talk about later as far as a replacement you can get at 50, but obviously if you are already exalted, you can just use the level 41 while leveling. A lot of this other stuff is fairly straightforward. You know, if you've been playing Warlock throughout Phase 2, you probably recognize a lot of this stuff. One thing that you may notice is... I'm going for just a very spell damage focused build. I'm not aiming for fire damage or shadow damage in particular, because while leveling up, especially this phase, your dungeon farming build or even your open world build is going to contain a mix of shadow and fire, roughly a 50-50 split. So we want to make sure that all of our gear is slightly survivability oriented. So things like synthetic mantle, there are better pure plus fire, plus shadow damage shoulders. Actually, for shoulders, it's just plus shadow. But obviously, we want to take the tanky option, and this still has really good spell damage. Definitely the best for spell damage. Necklace is a no-brainer. I'm putting the tailoring helm here, but of course, there are some other good options at this level that you can run. These are some higher level options, but the one-off thermoplug, white mane chapeau, if you have that, and you aren't a tailor, which... You might not be after we finish getting to the end of this video and I tell you why tailoring's kind of dead, unfortunately. But at least while leveling up, I plan to stick with tailoring because I already have my helm crafted. And a lot of the things that you're going to want to eventually replace your crafted helm from Nomergon with, you're not going to get until around level 50. So for leveling, I would say stick tailoring if you have it already. 
Some other obvious things here, like Blood Rock Cloak, as I mentioned, Glimmering Gizmo Blade, if you have it, duh, use it. It is still going to be one of our, I wouldn't necessarily say best in slot options, but it's like Biss Alternative. It is very close to what most people consider to be the three top daggers in this phase. So if you have this, you're not really going to replace it unless you get extremely lucky before entering the raid, but that is something that we'll cover a little bit later. Uh, Necronomicon, just while leveling up, there are, of course, things like Orb of No Rahel, but as we said, you want the spell damage. Dreamweave Gloves, highest spell damage you can get right now, pretty much no-brainer. Valdo Concoction Belt, while I've mentioned before that Hyperconductive Gold Wrap is very comparable in terms of, like, usage within Nomergon, it should go without saying that while you're leveling and you're not trying to just fish for the 3% crit to get, like, really big parses, it's slightly less valuable, or actually, no, it is considerably less valuable. It is a 15-minute cooldown. If you want to swap to it every 15 minutes, you can. But, I mean, is this really going to get you much? Like, you could get 10% movement speed for 30 seconds. I mean, like, it's not nothing, but generally speaking, I would say if you just want one belt to put on, I'm just personally going to wear a volatile concoction belt and kind of forget about it. Uh, keep this on hand. It actually might still be pretty solid at level 50 if you can roll the 3% crit, but we do have a lot of other good options like Banthok Sash, which once again, we'll talk about that later. Uh, while leveling, you should pretty much never replace your three-piece bonus. If you have the three-piece hyperconductive bonus, you're pretty much using this all the way into Sunken Temple. This is not going to get replaced until you get two piece of one of the new tier sets and only one which we'll cover that with the bis changes they did make some slight adjustments actually pretty major adjustments compared to what we've seen in previous phases to the set bonuses on both the warlock set and the generic caster set which means that the hyperconductive three piece is still quite strong it is better than anything you're going to find while leveling and the two-piece as well, even if you don't have the full three-piece, because I know a few people who I've talked to have gotten really unlucky, I only just recently got the pants, so barely got that by the time the phase was ended. Whoop. Uh, but if you do only have the two-piece, it's still worth keeping pretty much all the way until Sunken Temple as well, just because getting that 1% hit will be quite nice. And for rings, if you have, obviously, hypercharged gear, then that's really good. The level 38 Lore Keepers is very strong as well. If you don't have this, of course, just take the slightly weaker Lore Keepers. Where is it? Uh, this one, the plus seven. And worth noting, of course, we're getting another Lore Keepers ring. This will be on some of the best in slot lists, the pre -bis list for sure. And this thing you can buy right now and just keep in your bags. And the moment you hit level 48, bam, just slot it on there. And it's just a direct upgrade. Don't need to do anything special for it. Really nice. And wands, I don't really need to explain this, I hope it's, you know, the highest spell power wands, but trinkets are a little bit interesting. Namely, the Infernal Pact Essence. So, obviously these are high spell power trinkets, I shouldn't need to explain to you why this is good, but Infernal Pact Essence, the thing about this, while the Stamina and Intellect is nice, it's good for two things. Let's say it's good for three things. One, it's good for Soul Link, because giving your pet more stamina and then splitting your health with Soul Link is a nice thing to do. Unfortunately, if you haven't already heard, I'm probably going to talk about this on the main channel video, which, if you can see by the time down here, I have not actually yet recorded that. So, you know, it's a little bit unfortunate. I have to, right after I finish this, go and record that video. But I'm trying to think ahead about... What am I going to talk about that in video? What am I not going to mention in there that I can mention here to make sure everything's complete? And I'm almost certainly going to mention that Soul Link is dead because that is very important. It influences how we play the class as a whole going forward. I talked a lot in phase two about how I thought that meta Soul Link builds were going to be best in slot for phase three and how you're going to play Demonology with Master Demonologist and... That's going to be really nice. Well, unfortunately, that's just no longer the case. You can't use Soul Link with meta. You can still get Master Demonologist, but why would you bother? At this point, it's just not as good for damage. It's worse. And it's now significantly worse for survivability. 
Because quite literally, since you do not have Soul Link, you are actually losing survivability by playing Demonology because it is just more survivability to run an Imp for Blood Pact for the stamina buff. So Blizzard has completely killed Demonology and they have not provided us with an explanation. And I'm going to be honest, they are fucking bastards for it. Absolutely fucking ridiculous. Now, I think it's stupid that they nerfed it in the first place, but to nerf it and not even provide a fucking developer explanation, they gave other long death notes about, like, you know, shamans. We, we have nerfed shamans because we are adding this new super overpowered rune that gives them a shit ton of attack power, and we want to make sure that we fine-tune the class because, you know, we just fucking love shamans so much, so we're also going to add a really nice explanation so they don't get their feelings too hurt. Also, fuck that entire warlock build that so many people like, you want an explanation? Go fuck yourselves. We're not going to tell you. Well, fucking suck my dick, Blizzard. It's stupid, and I'm mad. So, I wanted to talk about it somewhere, and I might as well do it in a second channel video. It's bullshit. It's bullshit, and I'm mad. And, yeah, that's... that. That's... Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll stop ranting. Um, but, unfortunately, because Demonology is now completely dead, we cannot run the previous build so we don't really get much out of the stamina we still get intellect for our imp now notably since this is for leveling and while leveling you're definitely going to be wanting to do aoe pulls even if it's like out in the world definitely in dungeons you're going to do large aoe pulls and while technically you will be running an imp your imp's mana doesn't really matter that much getting the extra intellect it helps right but the main reason why you run Infernal Pact Essence is because with the Demonic Knowledge Rune, so this thing here, your spell damage is, or you gain increased spell damage equivalent to a proportion of your demon's intellect and stamina. And obviously, the Infernal Pact Essence gives you roughly 12 spell damage, so it is on par with those other trinkets, so it's really good. But as I am probably going to talk about in my Warlock leveling video, well, here's the thing, Shadow Flame kind of fucks now. It's actually really good. Now, it's only really consistently good if you are doing dungeon leveling. If you're just kind of questing on your own, you're not really going to be doing many five mob solo pulls while questing, I think. And in that case, you're going to be better off just running Demonic Knowledge. But if you're doing dungeons, there are countless five plus mob pulls, even more. And Shadow Flame, pretty much on five targets, is really good. Anything beyond that, it just starts to get ludicrous. I was running this in my guild's Nomergon run last night, and in that trash section leading up to Crowd Pummeler, I was just thrashing everybody. Shadow Flame was doing so much damage. When you start getting to really high target counts, this thing just absolutely cranks. The unfortunate thing about that is this means that because we don't have Demonic Knowledge, we're actually getting zero spell power for Infernal Pact Essence when we have Shadow Flame on, which is going to be in most dungeon runs. So you should still keep this on you. Whenever you are doing like boss fights, right, where you switch back to Demonic Knowledge, uh, I don't know if I'm going to go that far. We'll see. But if you decide to do that, then yes, put this back on. But whenever you do switch to Shadow Flame, I would highly suggest you drop this and take Invoker's Void Pearl. I would hope that most people have this by now. It's pretty easy to farm uh, Black Fathom Deeps if you've not done so already. And this is most likely going to also be, for max level dungeon farming, a really good trinket to have because we're going to get other trinket options at level 50, but most of them are going to come from the raid. So going into... <clears throat> Choked on my words there a little bit. It's early and I've been doing a lot of recording shit. Uh, I'm not doing any editing here, so fuck it. We just plow through. But having all three of those trinkets is going to be really helpful. The Combustion Chamber, the Pearl, and the Pact Essence. Technically speaking, there are certain trinkets that if you manage to get your hands on them to replace the Void Pearl, they could be nice because you will kind of want to replace this at some point, maybe just because... You're going to do it anyway, and the new Blood Moon Rings are situationally good. I'll talk about that later, though, so... I don't know. I like Infernal Pact Essence, but especially with the loss of Soul Link, it just kind of loses a lot of its luster. And 
previously when demonic knowledge was always the rune you took you didn't need to worry about like oh well do i need to swap off this but it's just kind of shit if you don't have demonic knowledge to give you spell power from this the odd use effect just really is not that good it doesn't do remotely enough damage to make it worth running just for that and outside of that you're just not really not going to get a lot of value in dungeons so that is basically what i'm running for leveling just wanted to at least go over that somewhere the main thing that I think a lot of people came here for is the previous stuff. So this is roughly what you're going to want to aim for before entering Sunken Temple. So some obvious ones here, like I said before, you're going to want to keep your hyperconductive three piece. This, like I said, you are not replacing for quite a while. You also notice I have these two trinkets here still, but as I said, you may want to drop Infernal Pact Essence for something else. Invoker's Void Pearl if you're doing trash for sure, but then... There are options. I don't know how feasible they're going to be. For instance, where can I find it? Gnomish Death Ray. If you are an engineer, this is probably going to be quite good. There are maybe slightly better options from Sunken Temple, but I would imagine this is going to be helpful to have going into the raid early on. So do keep that in mind. And the main other thing that I want to talk about, where is it, uh, is... Something like Torque Healed As, this is obviously a much more reliable option. I don't know where this is from. I suspect it's not from Sunken Temple, because it is requires level 40, right? So if it was a Sunken Temple item, it would require level 50. And this is equivalent to the Nomergon Trinket. So I have no idea where this is from. It could not even be four Warlocks. But if you do manage to get this early on, it could be worth just slotting this in. And then maybe you would replace one of these with a Blood Moon Ring. Hard to say. But just keep that in mind because obviously this is still partially speculation until we know where all of these items come from. Same thing with the Dark Moon cards. I do not know how practical any of these are going to be pre-raid. Could be one of those things where you just get all of them out of the world and bam, before you even set foot in Sunken Temple, you have one of these. Or it could be ridiculously rare and it's like a fortune to actually get it. Uh, if you really want survivability, obviously Smoking Heart of the Mountain is something, but it's, I think this trinket is extremely overrated. I see people blowing their load over this in the Warlock Discord, and I, we just really don't need additional armor. We already have a ton of armor. Generally, <clears throat> genuinely speaking, stamina is a better survivability stat for us at this stage than additional armor. Armor's not bad, but completely throwing away a trinket slot when we have options that do have some stamina on them it's just kind of pointless right so other stuff uh songstone of iron forge i kind of already talked about this in the other video this is from the final quest in black rock depths you have to kill emperor tharasan and go to either iron forge or orgrimmar whichever faction and it's a really good ring it has plus 18 spell damage and healing it's not just Prebis, this is, for most builds, effectively your Bis. It is very, very, very good. The problem is, while I am including this in Prebis, because technically you can do Blackrock Depths full clear before setting foot in Sunken Temple, I have no idea how practical that's going to be. I think for a lot of people, this is going to be not necessarily a Prebis option, but if it's not, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? You either take one of these Blood Moon Rings if you're able to farm it, which I'm assuming it's going to be comparable cost, and five silver coins was not hard to farm last phase, so you could probably get this pre-raid fairly easily, and it is not a bad option. Or you just take the other Lore Keeper's Ring or Hypercharge Gear. Really that easy. Not much to talk about there. Uh, what else? So Banthok Sash is from BRD. This is not too hard to farm. It's from the arena. A lot of people are going to want to farm the arena. That should really come as no surprise because the arena has a lot of good stuff. That being said, Banthok Sash is not necessarily the most consistent thing to farm. Anything from the arena is not going to be super consistent because you obviously need to get the boss first and then you need to get the actual item to drop as you after you've gotten that boss. Um, and while it is good... It's honestly not that sizable of an upgrade compared to Volo Concoction Belt. Really minor. And for, in fact, for damage, they are identical. They are both 1% hit, 12 spell damage. So you're mostly getting this for the slight bonus stamina and primarily the intellect. You could even argue that like the lower armor makes this 
around the same kind of for survivability. I would say that the extra stamina here matters more, but they're roughly equivalent. It's mostly just the intellect that's changing things here. So honestly, there is a strong argument to be made here of if you already have Volatile Concoction Belt, then just don't even waste your time farming Banthok Sash because there's like this, you know, big craze about we need to be pre-bis, we need to be pre-bis. At a certain point, enough is enough, right? Like I, I did all the crazy pre-bis grinds back in original classic. At this point, if something is super duper marginal compared to what I have, and there is a better item from the raid itself, which there is, Court of the Untamed, mind you, even this very small upgrade over Volatile Concoction Belt. This is still a very, very strong option. So it really, this should be your final concern because as we'll talk about later, there are much more important items that you should be farming and farming them could take a while. So it could be the case of you either continue farming for some of the other stuff to potentially get a really powerful upgrade that you could carry into your early Sunken Temple runs or you waste time farming for Banthok Sash, which really does very little for you. Now, this one is pretty straightforward. Earth Warder's Gloves, it's from a quest called Winterfall Activity. You can see this starts off Salfa. It's uh, one of the mobs in, what's it called? Uh, Winter Spring. It's from the Timbermaw Furbolg tribe. I don't remember exactly what rep you need to get it. Okay, that person doesn't help. I forgot to check this before I started. I think it's like neutral, right? Or do you get this early? Eh. Maybe just look for this later. Um, either way, it's from this quest. It's Earth Warder's Gloves. Gives you plus 22 spell damage and healing. If it does require verbal grep ahead of time, not really a big concern. Mob grinding towards the end not going to kill you. And if it doesn't, then great. You just head into Winter Spring and grab that. This will probably require you to be much closer to 50. Quite frankly, I am not even going to bother doing this until level 50. And I would suggest you do the same because it is a fairly minuscule upgrade over Dreamweave Gloves. It is an upgrade, though. And because it is not hard to get, you just do a quest, right? Which doesn't really have any major prereqs. You might as well do it before entering. And one of the nice things about these gloves is the upgrades are not that good. This is the only quote-unquote better piece of gear that we can get. And there are like some random greens that you could potentially buy off the auction house. I'm not including those for the record in the previous list. They'll be mentioned, of course, when we talk about the updated best in slot lists in a little bit. So if you are interested in that stuff, don't worry, I will discuss where it is relevant, but for a previous list like this, I'm not going to talk about, oh yeah, go to the auction house and buy a bunch of shit because I know not everybody cares about that. We're talking about only stuff that you can get from like quests, dungeons, rep, etc. because that is universally applicable. And these are still very good. Even the green options that we might talk about later are pretty marginal over these. Really, there's just not many good glove options this phase. I don't know why. Adelai Hexer's gloves are kind of shit. I don't even know if it's worth the added intellect. We don't really need it. Maybe. Eh. Hard to say for sure. But either way, this is going to be mostly your bis for the entire phase. Now, Spirit of Aquamentis, there are two options here. Kind of up to you which one you go for. There are reasons to go for either one. Now, it's either this which just gives you plus 20 magic effects. It's from the Lincoln quest line, I believe like the very end of the Lincoln quest line, at least towards the end, you have to kill a big elite in Ungoro Crater. And this is pretty difficult to get. You're really not going, well, you're definitely not going to be able to do this until 50, but I don't even think you can solo it at 50. I think this is one of those where if you want this, you'll have to ask your guild for help which is why some people may just choose to not bother with this and get Enthralled Sphere, which this is something that I didn't talk about in the previous video because it's one of the new dungeon drops that just got added in like the last day or two. So this is a reworked BRD dungeon drop from Inquisitor Gerstan, the one like if you enter BRD and you take a right and you go into like the little prison area, she's the boss over there. So pretty easy to farm, 
very easy section of the dungeon, relatively low level. I believe it's like 52, 53. So shouldn't give you any trouble getting this. And there's a lot of other mobs, as we'll discuss, that you'll want to farm there anyways. So this gives you 1% hit, 8 spell damage and healing, 9 intellect. Intellect's kind of whatever. This... I think we should mainly compare it to the current ones that you'll want to use, namely Necronomicon or Desert Walker Kane is something that you might get while leveling because pretty much everybody's going to be spamming Zulfarak. This is a very marginal upgrade over Necronomicon, though it is an upgrade. And obviously when you get this, presumably everybody will get this while farming Zulfarak because the amount of Zulfarak's people are probably going to run and the fact that this is not a very hard item to get, it's just going to be a nice interim upgrade you could genuinely make a case for using this all the way until raid but i would say if you really want to go the extra mile one of these two pieces the only reason why i say spirit of aquamentus over enthralled spear is because while leveling enthralled spear is not going to be that great for you because you're mostly going to be playing affliction setups as we'll discuss in a little bit and as i probably have mentioned in my main channel video whenever i record that and the thing about affliction is suppression gives you really good hit chance so you don't actually need additional hit. So Enthralled Spear is... It's meant for effectively fire builds that need the hit. But realistically speaking, you can't actually reach hit cap while leveling as fire. So it's like kind of pointless. You're probably going to enter the raid with not full hit anyways. I guess you could still make an argument that maybe... Enthralled Spear for the hit is better than Spirit of Aquamentus. I could definitely see it. And we'll see. Uh, there's some other items that I'm not including here in from the BIS list because I don't know exactly how feasible they're going to be to obtain. So I could see it go either way. While you're still leveling, while you're farming dungeons, this one is the clear winner. But maybe if this helps you reach hit cap, if you have some other items that get you there and you can reach 5% by running this, then take it. But that is only for like when you're about to enter Sunken Temple and you're doing single target fights with Fire Destro, then it could be a good option. But long term, like this is not your best in slot item. Obviously on 60 upgrades, it has the same ranking, but what I can tell you right now is there are much easier ways to get hit. You're not going to want to get it here. You will be running Drake Stone. This is your best in slot, but it's from the raid, of course. So you will eventually replace Enthralled Spear despite it still being fairly solid, but they're all roughly in the same ballpark. Um, I'm going to skip this, but you may understand why I'm going to talk about it later, because it's probably the most important thing here. Now, Dryad's Wrist Bindings, this is the Warsung Gulch Bracers, same deal here. Now, we'll mention this a little bit later, but if you are engineering, there are going to be new crafted bracers that are better than the Warsung Gulch ones for you by one spell power, and they have slightly better stats elsewhere and if you are engineering you don't even need to do the warsung gulch farm though obviously it's pretty easy now which makes engineering have considerably less value unlucky and it's uh unclear at the moment how you're going to get these i think it is a pretty safe assumption that it's going to require completion of sunken temple or at least a good bit of sunken temple cleared because that has been the standard set forth thus far you enter the raid in the case of bfd and there's like some stuff that you need to do to like pick up the box with like the void shard and obviously in nomergon you needed to talk to ziri and i guess nomergon you technically didn't need to clear the entire thing but you at least needed to kill grubbis and then get some other stuff from the raid so who knows how far it's going to require you to go one interesting thing though is you may notice that ziri is mentioned in the flavor text here so it is not impossible that, hey, maybe this actually sends you to Nomergon and requires you to do maybe stuff in the Dream Incursions. And then you go to the Nomergon and do the Dream Incursions and do some outside of the raid questline. Who knows? Maybe you could enter the raid with those engineering bracers. And I guess if you are an engineer, that would be awesome. But until we know that for sure, if you have Warsung Gulch Rep, go with that. If you don't have Warsung Gulch Rep, Honestly, there's not a lot of good options, which is kind of one of the reasons why if you're not engineering, you need to get these bracers now. You don't really have a choice now that it's easy to farm. Just get like a, a blue or a, not a blue, a, a green. Like it, genuinely, it's just better, right? Because obviously arena risk guards, despite that, they're pretty shit. You can maybe run these if you stall off them from Nomergon, but I would say 
just grab like some green in the meantime. If you don't want to buy a green, get these from Nomergon. You can still do it while leveling. You should be doing it while leveling for the XP and then eventually transition into these or the NG Bracers. Uh, obviously, Hyperconductive we already talked about. Sprite Caster Drape, this is another one that's from Dungeons. This is from Houndmaster Greb Bar in Blackrock Depths. It's the little guy with the dogs that patrols around the arena, very close to Gerston and the Banthok Sash guy. So you have a lot of Prebis in the first section of Blackrock Depths, and that's obviously where the arena is. So you'll have a lot of people who want to run this with you, most likely. A lot of melee DPS are going to be running those arena bosses. I wonder if... Can you get Savage Gladiator Chain right now? I actually didn't look into it. Savage Gladiator Chain. It, ah, it requires level 52. Okay, so they won't be farming for that. But I do believe there are some other good items. But yeah, this drops off the Houndmaster. It's pretty straightforward. There are potentially better pure fire options as greens. But like Cindercloth Cloak is worse. Uh, this is from some quest, but it's plus 17 fire. Uh, that's not worth it. You're also losing stamina. So the only thing that I would replace this with is this cloak, which I do have on my fire abyss list, as we'll get into it later. But if you don't manage to buy this, don't even buy one of the other ones. I would not waste gold on like any of these mediocre cloaks. If you're not getting the absolute best, then just get the easy to acquire Sprite Caster Cape. It's better than our current options. It's just like a better... Blood Rock Cloak. What's not to love? Now, Shoulders, this is a bit of a tricky one. So, obviously, we still don't know what's going on with the tailoring stuff, where you're going to get it. I think a safe assumption, once again, is that it's from Sunken Temple, so I'm not including it on this list. But I also don't even think you're going to stay tailoring, as I will discuss. So, you probably won't even use that anyway. Now, you have a few different options here. I put Kentic Amis just because... Well, it drops off Gerston, and we already want to kill her for the Enthralled Sphere as a potential option. And I should note that Enthralled Sphere will be pretty good when you initially get to 50, right? Because getting that Spirit of Aquamentus thing is going to require you to do a lot of quests at 50, and a lot of those will be high-level quests, so hey, additional hit chance can't hurt, right? So if anything, you're going to want to get this, and then, if you so choose, move into Spirit later on, which means you'll be killing Gerston a lot, You'll probably get these shoulders. They're perfectly fine. That being said, for pure survivability... Where is it? Um, oh, it's right there. Went right past it. Synthetic Mantle from Nomergon is still really strong. This has more stamina than any other shoulder options except the crafted tailoring ones. And I think the yeah PvP ones have more, but they're PvP shoulders, right? These are probably better than... Synthetic Mantle, if you manage to get it. It has one less spell power, but it has significantly more stamina and intellect. So overall, these are going to be stronger. But I would say long term, you're going to want to just run with the high spell damage ones. Rock Grip Mantle has one less spell damage than Kentic, but way more intellect. If you care about that, actually not even that much more. The one nice thing about Rock Grip is it comes from that crocodile in Earthsong Falls right before Theradris. And as we will discuss in a little bit, uh, we are going to be farming Theradris pretty much non-stop until we enter Sunken Temple for the first time. At least if you are like me, and you are going to be min-maxing your heart out. So, uh, last two things. All of the good necklaces, to my knowledge, are going to come from the raid. I'm not 100% sure about this, but it makes logical sense for these to be from the raid, right? They're all necklaces that require level 50 they're most likely sunken temple boss drops i don't suspect anything else so until then just keep your nomergon neck if you don't have it run nomergon while leveling as you already have and helmet so i'm not going to talk about eye of the flame here or the boes because realistically you're not going to be getting these before you enter raid and as i already said i want to focus on generally obtainable stuff now visage of the exiled you get this i believe from zul farak but i could be wrong in that now that i think about it because it does have oh maybe i am wrong in that yeah because i th initially thought this was going to be from zul farak but then i noticed level 50 there's a very similar item 
Uh, okay. Uh, I suppose I actually am wrong in this. Well, I'm not going to re-record this now. Uh, I guess this is just very similar to a Zulfarok item that they've just made, most likely a Sunken Temple drop. So this is going to be, in many cases, your best in slot. Other options that you have, you can still stick with the Tailoring Helmet. This does make Tailoring a little bit more enticing just because most other Helmet options suck. And obviously, if you're Engineering, the Spell Power Goggles are pretty good. Losing the hit honestly makes this a little bit more enticing, but... There's this, which gives you added fire damage, but if you're going to go with something that gives you fire, and I believe this is from... It sends you into Sunken Temple. I don't know if it can completed, be completed outside the raid or if it requires you to go in. Either way, it's not good. So realistically, you're going to take this for pure spell damage, or you're going to just stick with the Tailoring Helmets. A lot of these other things, Dreamweave Circlet, just don't even bother. Uh, I think... Given that most of the other options at this stage are not very great, and unfortunately the Emerald Dream and PvP helmets are not that good, if you are like me and you're aiming to drop tailoring so you will not have this going into Sunken Temple, then you should probably go with one of the engineering greens of Fiery Wrath, or of Shadow Wrath, which isn't here, obviously, because I have it sorted by fire damage. I don't think Eye of Flame is a realistic option. I could have... I, I wonder where... I saw that there was something from... This might be what... I think this is what I'm thinking of. I got it confused with Bad Mojo Mask, which is from Zulfarok. I think that is exactly what happened. Which, like, yeah, this helmet is dog water. So, I saw this. I thought it was the Zulfarok helmet. I was wrong. Um... This is still a good helmet, just it looks like it's a Sunken Temple drop. Which is interesting, because then we have something of the Exiled, and we have another thing of the Exiled. So I believe there's probably going to be some boss, the Exiled. And there is one boss slot that I've not been able to figure out what it's going to be, so that... I guess we'll find out in 24 hours, though, so there's no real point speculating now. And what else... Yeah, I guess just get the um, engineering stuff. If you don't have engineering, then you could try your luck with one of these. But it's kind of one of the problems. Our helmet options really suck unless you have tailoring. And I guess... So I'll talk about tailoring now, just because this is something that is more important for min-maxing best in slot in general. But I guess it also applies to pre -bis. Basically, Blizzard buffed the enchanting sigils by a lot. I honestly think it's an unreasonable buff. They give 50 spell power now. They are just so far ahead of every other profession. It's just free 50 spell power that stacks with everything else. So effectively, if you are interested in your performance at all, there is absolutely no reason why you should not be enchanting. Because in Nomergon, it was at least a little bit more eh, because tailoring was very good, because the tailoring helmet, this thing is insane. It still is really, really strong, and it was obviously nuts when it was current content, but the new tailoring shoulders, I kind of talked about this in my last video, but they just kind of suck dick. They're just really not that good. Like, 13 spell damage and healing is just so... Why? Why are we making the end game crafted item have less spell damage than Kentagamas? And what do you get for it? You get a small proc chance. I believe it was a 10% proc chance with a 30 or 40 second cooldown. I forget exactly what it is. It doesn't have super high uptime. And it gives you 30 spell damage. Wow. And increased dodge, which like, yeah, whatever. And the stats on it are fine, right? Obviously, a lot of armor, a lot of intellect, a lot of stamina. It's a tanky pair of shoulders. But here's the thing. If you want tanky shoulders, like these are right here. They have almost exactly the same in terms of tanky stats and 11 spell damage and healing barely below this so if you could take this without tailoring yes this would be your best in slot but the fact that you need to sacrifice a profession to take it you need to sacrifice flat 50 spell damage it's like what are you going to choose a low uptime on 30 spell power or guaranteed 100 percent uptime 50 spell power 
they've just undertuned the shit out of these shoulders. And I, unless they buff it, which they might, but they just did a round of buffs for the professions, and they buffed enchanting, and they didn't touch these, so... Don't really know what Blizzard's thinking there, but they've made enchanting even more mandatory. And mind you, enchanting was already better than tailoring, even before that buff. Why they thought, yeah, you know, enchanting's already the highest simming profession for warlocks. Let's give it 20 extra spell power. Like, just, it's... I, 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 I don't even know. It's like, what, a 75% increase, roughly? 66% increase? Fucking ridiculous, man. Um... So enchanting is basically mandatory, and because at endgame we're going to be replacing our helmet with Visage of the Exiled or Eye of Flame or something of Fiery Wrath, well, we're going to be dropping the, the tailoring helmet because it's good, but this is... You get a 50 spell damage and healing for 12 seconds on a 10-minute cooldown. Okay, well, you get this... Every other fight, and while it is good for the fight where you use it, obviously the reduced mana cost, really nice. You get this, it's a big burst. This is mainly good for, like, the Everlasting Affliction snapshotting build that I talked about. But on single target, I just don't think that's looking to be realistic this phase. There's just not really enough support for it compared to the other stuff that we have. So I don't really think we're going to have it. Who knows? Could be the case. But even then, it's still not going to be better than the Enchanting Sigil. Because once again, lat 50 spell power the entire fight, are you going to take that? Or are you going to take 50 spell power for 12 seconds on a 10 minute cooldown? So while both of these pieces combined are like solid, they do not compare to 100% uptime on 50 spell power. I know I've said that a lot, but I I'm frustrated about it. I'm frustrated that they're just killing tailoring after they forced us to take tailoring for like the first two phases and now it's just like hot psych drop your profession i i really hate the way that professions are being handled in sod i'm gonna be honest i fucking hate mandatory professions for uh power gain i get that it's like kind of classic e but i would argue that nobody really likes that it's not even like a classic thing and classic it was like you take engineering and then you get to pick whatever profession you want and being forced into professions for damage gain is like a wrath through mop thing. And then they realize that sucks dick. And for all future expansions, they've tried to decouple professions with power, with the exception of engineering, which every now and then rears its ugly head as like a mandatory utility profession and like retail. But that's besides the point. But being forced to never pick any profession you want because these specific ones give you a completely massive damage gain. It sucks. It really does. And it seems like they're just doubling down on that as the phases go on. So what can we really do about it? Um, but I guess, yeah, for this, I'll change this into we're just going to put Green Lens of Fiery Wrath. Obviously, for this, I'm kind of assuming that you're engineer. But if you're not engineer, there are other options. You could get the any of these greens or just go with a slightly weaker alternative. Even the Thermoplug helmet is not awful, but you'll be able to get things like the Theradrus one, which, you know, you're going to kill Theradrus a lot. Uh, what's the new Eye of Theradrus? It is this one. It's not really that good, but if you have literally no other options, it's fine. It has a lot of stamina, good amount of intellect. Eh. Okay. This is, I believe, from... I think this is from the Explorer Imp stuff. I feel like I saw somebody post this, but uh, there's a lot of new, like, random Warlock things that you can get. But we'll see. Kind of waiting to see what the helmet thing looks like. I mentioned before while leveling, I'm going to keep this. So my current plan is I'm going to wait to see how the crafting stuff shakes out. If we can't get any of the crafted items until after the first week of Sun Sunken Temple, I will probably just enter the raid with this equipped. Maybe. Just because, obviously, if you can't get the 50 enchanting sigil then yeah this is probably still better to have because it beats out all of our other alternatives but i would not invest anything into tailoring really i'm not even going to bother leveling my tailoring i will level my engineering because there are some nice things about engineering uh, i should note though engineering technically speaking is not worth it it is 
nowhere near as big of a damage loss as running tailoring is going to be because there are some good stuff, right? Like the engineering bracers are technically Arbis if you have them, but obviously the Warsong Gulch ones, which are now very easy to get, are pretty much comparable. So before it was like, oh, hey, well, if you don't want to farm Warsong Gulch, which I certainly didn't, I was looking at engineering as a silver lining for that. Well, now I'm going to be very easily able to get the Warsong Gulch ones, so it's less impactful. And engineering mainly has the advantage of bombs. That is good, but how much of a difference does that really make? And the other thing to consider for engineering, which is something you may want to run before entering the raid, is the Gnomish Death Ray. This, of course, is a pretty good trinket, but I have to wonder how good it's going to be compared to the stuff we have in Sod. This could just be one of those things where everybody remembers it as a very powerful option from Classic, and then we actually get to play around with it, and it's pretty mediocre. I don't really know... I'll have to test to see how it works out. It could also be that they've changed something about this. I don't think so because I've looked at all of the data mine profession stuff and the only thing that I can find is recipes to allow you to learn the other specializations items, which, okay, I guess, you know, if they if that's what they want to do with it, then I think that's all they're really going to do, make it so specializations don't matter at all, which I think is odd. But they said they have some big plans for it, and I don't know. I don't really know what we're going to be seeing as far as that goes. Uh, but this could be an advantage to engineering. Keep in mind, though, you could also just level up your engineering, learn this, and then once you craft it, abandon engineering, and you can still use it even if you don't have engineering. So really all the profession has going for it is the bombs, which, you know, Goblin Sapper Charge is nice. It is a good thing from engineering and like generic grenades are fine there's no good easy throw alternatives at this level range so that's going to be something for us but alchemy is also 30 flat spell power with no conditions so it might just be better it well it is just better but it, whether or not it is a significant upgrade over engineering or if they're like only slightly ahead that I'm not entirely sure on. It kind of remains to be seen. But we do know that enchanting is super far ahead. Uh, last thing, or last two things. I realized I forgot to talk about this. Uh, Pyric Caduceus. I have no fucking clue how to say that word. Uh, is from Pyromancer Lorgrain, which is another Blackrock Depths boss. This guy is, I believe, like in the first half. Isn't he... It's like above the arena, right? If you go around the opposite side of the arena and you like hook a right he's by the statue i think where you turn in like the um what's the, whatever the the architect's hammer is and you put it in the statue and stuff i think that's where this guy is if memory serves so not too hard to get he drops fiery weapon enchant which a lot of people are going to be farming and this wand in case i didn't mention it before is plus 13 fire spells and effects so this is obviously only good if you are running a fire damage build, which for raid you most likely will, as we'll discuss later on. This is not just pre bis this is bis. There are no better ones. The only thing is Nightmare Trophy, which I suspect is from the raid, but Blizzard in their infinite wisdom decided to make this identical to Mechano Shred or Gear Shrifter, except for five intellects, so it's like... For non-fire users, this is technically their bis. I guess, but really it's it's the same because the intellect just doesn't fucking matter and this is just easier to get. I don't know, kind of a weird choice on Blizzard's end to make a lot of the Sunken Temple loot just really undertuned. And finally, we got to talk about Blade of Eternal Darkness. So here's the thing about Blade of Eternal Darkness. Kind of similar to the aforementioned wand, while this is a pre this list, you'll notice that this is now on every single one of my best in slot lists. And this is by far the biggest change to any of our BIS that we're going to be seeing from Phase 3. So this was just recently added to the loot tables. Now, Blade of Eternal Darkness, the only thing that it's changed is it used to just have the on-equip effect of, you know, the damaging spell thing, and now it just has plus 20 to magic spells and effects, which is ludicrous. So I didn't really know about this dagger, some people have told me that it actually was pretty good just in general back in earlier phases of like classic original classic because apparently it procs really often and it procs off 
I, I've seen conflicting information. Some people say it procs off dots. Some people say it doesn't proc off dots. One thing that a lot of people say is that this was very good for mage AOE farming and that it has no internal cooldown. So very quick ticks of damage like Arcane Explosion can proc this a lot. And we're getting Immolation Aura. And Immolation Aura does consistent ticking fire damage. And it's like not a dot, it's a pulse around you. So it might work like that Arcane Explosion thing where this gives us extra procs. But even if it doesn't, even if this just has a, a high proc chance, like everybody says it does on regular spells, it's still going to be insane. I don't necessarily know if without the plus 20 spell damage and healing, this would have been our abyss. It sounds like based on what people are saying, it might have been for AoE stuff. And I guess I overlooked it, so uh, my bad on that. But with plus 20 spell damage and healing, this is just ludicrous. Because this is more than Glimmering Gizmo Blade. It's the same as Hubris the Bandit Brander. And it's... Well, obviously less fire damage than Modus Carcoon, it's still right up there. It is on the level of the Sunken Temple drops. And there's obviously Inventor's Focal Sword, which if you don't have Gizmo Blade, you can use this. I personally would still recommend using Gizmo Blade. But if you do not have Gizmo Blade, this is a good option. I guess it's worth discussing. But realistically speaking, we are going to be in Maradon farming Princess until our eyes bleed. So I've probably discussed this in my previous video already, which is why I kind of left it to last because you might already know about this, but it is worth saying it's nuts, right? So we're going to basically at level 50, hit up Blackrock Depths for a few things. We're going to grab our pirate... Uh, Caduceus. I'm going to call it Cad Caduceus. I don't fucking know. We're going to grab this. We're going to grab this because they're very easy to get. We're going to grab Kentic Amis. These are very easy to get. Just a few runs. Like within five runs, we should hopefully have all three of those items. Shouldn't be too hard. If you want to try for Banthox Sash, I guess go for it. It is very marginally better. But personally, once you have these other three items, I would not continue grinding the arena to try and get your hands on this. I just do not see that being worth doing. That is a waste of time. Because what I'm going to do is the moment I hit level 48, I am entering Earthsong Falls and I am grinding that up to 50. And I'm going to go for the Blade of Eternal Darkness because I mean, you can't even use it at 48, but at least you're getting relatively good experience from Earthsong Falls at that level. And that way you can start that grind. And the moment I finish cleaning up the rest of the stuff from like BRD, that's really easy to grab. I'm heading right back into Earthsong Falls and I'm just kind of going to slam my face into this. Like, I'm not even going to bother with Spirit of Aquamentus. If I enter the raid with Enthralled Spear, so be it. Right. I, I don't even care if I get my hands on this because this is just absolutely critical. It is our best in slot dagger for the current phase. Really, really, really crazy that they buffed it this much. It's just better than everything else. Like, even with a full fire damage build. I guess if you only care about survivability, then run like Modus Carcoon, right? Or just keep Gizmo Blade. But this is just better by a mile for damage. Unless they have like secretly nerfed the proc rate into the floor, in which case it'll still be good just for the spell damage and healing. But if the proc rate here is dog shit, then it would be not super great. But everybody says that this thing procs an insane amount. And that is even not including the Immolation Aura interaction. Um, something that I haven't really discussed as far as runes go. Uh, this is obviously, you know, what your best in slide gear is. And we don't know where the runes are going to come from. So it could just be that they pull a fast one and they tell us that Pandemic is going to be ludicrously hard to get. Or Immolation Aura is going to be really hard to get. I will say right now, this current speculation based on data mining is that Immolation Aura... Uh, I can't click on the rune. Immolation Aura is probably going to be from the Dream Incursions, so go do that. Uh, they've said it's going to be decent for leveling, so you might want to do it while leveling anyways, as like an alternative to Zool for Rock Spam once you have the stuff you need, which I guess at this point isn't much. But Immolation Aura is, we know how it's obtained in terms of the items. You combine three Dream Spire things 
and then you get the rune and people think it's from the dream incursions i'm inclined to agree pandemic i forget exactly if i recall correctly there is a rune from mobs in Feralis. it's off like some grim totem mobs and then some null mobs you kill them you get a drop you combine it you get a rune and i forget if that is pandemic or unstable affliction it's one of the two most likely and i am going to be testing that very early on into my leveling run later today like my live stream so if you're watching this later in the day and i'm currently live streaming on my main channel go check out that stream i may have already found the pandemic rune if it is that one that i know is there uh because that one is very clearly shown and most likely there's going to be a level 50 warlock quest chain that gives one of the runes I have no idea which one that might be. I suspect it'll be Felguard, and I also suspect that Felguard is just not really going to be that great. I just cannot see Felguard doing enough damage to justify running it over Imp. So unless Felguard just absolutely fucking demolishes things and just is ridiculously overtuned, you're probably just going to get these two runes, Pandemic and Emma Aura, early on and run it for virtually everything. Pandemic, I will say, it's once you have that, you are going to run it on almost every single thing in the game. If you do manage to get Vengeance before entering the raid, it could be nice because having that cooldown in your back pocket, if the fight requires it, could be helpful. And I really don't think there's any merit to anything but Immolation Aura, I'm going to be honest. Even for, and that's for damage, right? But for survivability too, 10% magic DR completely gcd list ability that you activate and it just does damage over a demon that replaces your imp which mind you demonology is dead so we're not running soul link so we don't even really give a fuck what master demonologist does because we're not taking it so unless felgard just on its own gives you a ton of damage and survivability why would you take it over imp which already does a ton of damage and gives your group blood pact which also gives you a ton of stamina it's already the best damage pet and it's the best survivability pet now with Soul Link dead. Why would you run anything else? I don't know. Um, An unstable affliction, I should note right now. It doesn't seem like they plan on buffing it. And it's really bad. So you're probably never going to take it. And I've adjusted my talent builds, which we'll take a look at shortly. Actually, before, before we look at the three endgame best in slot builds that I put together... I will quickly go over talent options. So this is what I suspect we're going to be running for raids. This is basically just pure single target, fire damage, really not much to say here. I think I had a build exactly like this on my previous video. The only thing is now I have tested Demonic Tactics. It's good. I ran it in my Nomergon run. It's a perfectly suitable replacement for Lake of Fire. Oh, on the topic of Lake of Fire, because this did get nerfed. The nerf is 100% confirmed now. The way that this works is super, super dumb. So it requires you to channel it for its full duration. And a lot of people were wondering what that means. So it is the janky method that some people suspected where the final tick of Lake of Arena Fire is what counts as fully channeling it because Blizzard's shit at coding and can't think of any other more creative solution. Um, so the final tick is what gives you the Rain of Fire buff or Lake of Fire buff. And the way that that works is if a mob pushes you back to the absolute last tick and then you fully finish that, you get the buff. But if a mob pushes you past the end of the channel, you do not get the buff. So the rune, just to be clear, is completely unusable. It is dead, for sure. Uh, there are people saying, well, what if you run rain of fire and force yourself to get pushed back by mobs so that you get to the final tick and then you get the 50 percent buff and i can tell you right now not only is that just impractical to have happen because on multiple targets you're going to be getting so much pushback that you will have zero control over whether or not you reach the final tick or not most of the time i don't even think it is mathematically possible on like a lot of targets to reach the final tick so you would only really have it happen on single target where it perfectly lines up that you take like roughly two auto attacks during the channel to perfectly knock you back to the final tick and then you would get the buff and that's just not consistent you cannot consistently do that 
right? And even then, in order to make it consistent, you would need to spend time channeling Reign of Fire to make sure that the ticks lined up. And it's a damage loss at that point. If you are sitting there channeling Lake of Fire or Reign of Fire instead of pressing Searing Pain, who gives a shit if you get 50% increased fire damage? You're just losing damage. You're going to get more damage from Demonic Tactics. I tested it out in my guild's last Nomergon clear, and my damage with Demonic Tactics was basically the same as my damage from last week and previous weeks with um, Lake of Fire. It's hard to tell, like, comparing my best parses, because obviously on a lot of my best parses, I had really good crit RNG, I had really good Grimoire of Synergy uptime, stuff like that, so... Who knows? I also didn't have Moonkin Aura last night, so that was a bit unfortunate. But if we like average out my damage on most fights, Demonic Tactics is perfectly fine. So I suspected that you would be using this one, and that appears to be the case. It is still very good. Uh, Immolation Aura, pretty straightforward. It's just free damage. I've seen a lot of people shitting on Immolation Aura saying, like, it does such little damage. And yeah, it doesn't do a lot of damage. But... What a lot of people I don't think realize is because Immolation Aura is, it is an aura. It's like a, not necessarily a Paladin Aura exactly like that, but think about it like a Paladin Aura where you press it, you activate it, and then it just exists. You do not press anything extra. Immolation Aura could be doing one additional DPS. And if that one additional DPS was completely free and all of these other things were either a damage loss or damage neutral, it would still be the best rune just because you would be getting free damage. But it's like, I saw some people on the Warlock Discord saying it looks like it's going to be on single target like 45 to 70 DPS. And that sounds really low, right? But it is completely free damage. You get it for nothing. And we also get flat 10% magic DR while taking this. So it's a rune that gives us passive damage and passive magic DR. It's just nuts. It's really good. And of course, on multiple targets, this is really good. It's very, very good. And this is, once again, completely ignoring the potential ramifications of this plus Blade of Eternal Darkness. So you're almost certainly going to run Immolation Aura on literally everything, especially considering they have not adjusted Unstable Affliction. And the only considerations that we had for whether or not Felguard was going to be run was when we still thought that Soul Link was going to be a build that you played, in which case, if you are... Running Soul Link, you cannot run Imp because it gives you reduced threat with Master Demonologist. But now that you're not running Demon Demonology at all, well, you're probably just going to take Imp. So before, the question was, in Demonology builds, do you run Felguard over Succubus? Well, now there are no Demonology builds. So now the question is, in Aft Destro or Deep Destro, do you run Felguard over Imp plus Immolation Aura? Because you're, you're losing the damage on Imp, and you're also losing free damage from Emma Aura. And this thing would need to be so ludicrously overtuned to be able to beat out free damage and mitigation, plus the damage and blood pact from Imp. And I can tell you right now, it's not going to happen. Like, I, I will eat a shoe if Felgard... No, I won't eat a shoe. I, I'm not going to fucking risk that. Um, I will... I will make a YouTube post on my main channel saying I am a big stupid dumb dumb head uh, who is shit at Warlock Tank, and I will I will make that public right if uh, Felguard ends up being the meta pick for like builds like this right there there is still a chance right that if somebody is running Deep Demo it is better for them but Deep Demo is going to be a meme build so I, I will say right now two things if Deep Destro or any sort of Destro heavy hybrid ends up running Felguard over Immo Aura, that bet stands. Or if Deep Demo, by some imaginary, I don't know what would have to happen for that to be the case, if something miraculous happens and Deep Demo is not only the meta damage build, but also still runs Felguard, then I will I will stand up to that, right? I will call myself a big stupid dumb dumb head for saying that Felguard is bad. But there's just no way, right? You know, the people thinking that you're going to get all the buffs of Master Demonologist, you're smoking crack. It's not going to happen. And there's absolutely no way that Blizzard is just going to make this, like, this pet deal so much damage that its auto attacks beat out Imp plus free damage from Immolation Aura. Just not going to happen. 
Uh, and mind you, this would only be for single target. Now, my bet stands for pure single target, but there is absolutely no chance that on anything three target plus, you're going to run Felguard. The only interesting case that I've heard for Felguard is two targets because it's like pet attack is a two target cleave. Maybe, but I don't see it. I don't know. And then once again, just to reiterate pandemic, like this is what every single build that you'll see here is running. Conflagrate is dead. Backdraft is dead. You're not going to run this just to buff like, oh, wow, my incinerate has 30% spellcasting haste and my immolate has 30% spellcast. No, it's not worth. You have to press extra buttons and then you have to consume your immolate, which no, <laughs> no, backdraft is shit. Uh, it, you're not going to play this at all. Um, Pandemic is definitely going to be good. The only thing with a build like this is you're going to be pressing immolate and just keeping immolate up and you will weave it in, right? You'll do the traditional incinerate emulate. And with Pandemic, so actually pressing emulate before was a very marginal damage gain. It was, technically speaking, in a perfect rotation, it was better to keep emulate up on the target, but it was barely, barely worth it. Now with Pandemic, it is going to be much more worth to get that emulate up on the target and you incinerate into emulate. So we unfortunately still have hard casts. It unfortunately still sucks. Um, as a result of this, I am <laughs> feel bad saying this, but uh, I'm no longer going to be maining Warlock tank. I'm going to play it for the start of Sunken Temple because I already have my Warlock tank at full bis from Nomergon. And I, at the very least, I was excited about it until they killed Demonology. And I would feel bad for all of you guys who like watching these videos and have been like, you know, talking actively in my Discord and, and stuff like that. Um, I don't want to just like say, fuck the spec, leave you guys high and dry. Uh, so <laughs> maybe not where I expected to say this. I did mention this in my Discord in passing. My current plan is play Warlock Tank, clear Sunken Temple a few times, uh, get out my guides for it when I've like, you know, really gotten the rotation down and feel like I know how it plays the best make all my guides, drop the spec completely. Uh, I really just have zero interest in it going forward. Sorry. Um, and maybe if the phase four runes look really, really interesting, I'll pick it back up again for 50 to 60. But as it stands, I find Paladin to be much more interesting. And even then, frankly, Paladin, I'm like, eh. So I'm going to play Paladin for my Alliance Guild. And one thing that I want to try to do is I'm going to start working on my Shaman because... I mean, let's be honest, it's the only class that's getting real attention from the sod devs. Everything else just feels like an afterthought. So um, I just don't really have any interest in playing a class where one of the most exciting builds just got completely nuked with no explanation. I'm extremely pissed off about that. And I don't like playing a caster that has to hard cast things as a tank when you have pushback. It just encourages you to do degenerate stuff to try and maximize your damage. Um, mind you, I, I should note for, for the record, it is still the best build, or at least it was in Phase 2, and it most likely will be in Phase 3, even if you aren't doing degenerate parsing crap. But as somebody who likes doing degenerate parsing crap, I feel like I have to toe the line between like how you are supposed to play this build and how you want to play this build if you want to maximize your damage, and that's just not fun for me. It's also not fun for the people who have to play around me, right, if I ask them to do stuff. And like I'll always ask first. I'll be like, hey, can you help me out here so I can like parse better? And if people say no, I don't, but I... it. I don't like that. I, I do not like what Blizzard is trying to force us to do. But it is what it is. They um they seem dead set on having us play this build for some fucking reason. So congratulations, Blizzard. I agree. It's probably going to be the best uh pure single target build. Fun. Um, this is the AoE builds. I have some variations on this, as you will see, but this is what I think is going to be the standard, like pure damage optimized setup. So obviously Emulation Aura, no brainer there. I said before there was a chance that you would press um, Unstable Affliction on a build like this, but you're not going to. Right now it's bad. You're just going to run Emulation Aura and still take Everlasting Affliction. You only need two out of five in Suppression to reach Hit Cap for Affliction spells. And most likely if you're running this build, you are going to not reach Hit Cap with your Fire stuff because... The only real fire spell that you care about reaching hit cap with in this setup is going to be... Uh, I did have... 
Yeah, I have Incinerate on here. Okay, good. I just for some reason thought I didn't. Um, obviously, in that other build, you have like Incinerate and Searing Pain. But here, it's just Searing Pain, and Searing Pain is less of your overall damage. This is if you have basically two to three targets, roughly, is where this build is going to shine. So I suspect there's going to be at least one to two bosses in Sunken Temple that are multi-target. We already know that there's going to be Ogam and Jamalon. And I believe, based on data mining, that fight will have additional adds on top of just the two bosses. And I suspect that the dragon bosses will be similar to their original counterparts, where we fight anywhere from two to four dragons at the same time, and multi-dotting will be good there. So this build will likely see play in Sunken Temple. Uh, you're going to obviously run Pandemic and Everlasting Affliction. That's a no-brainer. Um, Immolation Aura, just better. It's free damage, and it just it's good. Uh, now, I will, I'll talk about Demonic Knowledge versus Shadow Flame, because if you don't know, Shadow Flame got like roughly a 400% buff. So, yeah, uh, it turns out when you do something that crazy, suddenly abilities start to become good. That being said, I tested Shadow Flame, I ran it on Mechanical Menagerie last night in my guilds run, and it was not bad, but it did not impress me. And I believe that for these types of fights, anywhere from anywhere pretty much up to four targets, especially if they're spread out, right? One of the other things about Menagerie is a lot of times I was only hitting two targets with my Shadow Flame because if the dragon was like, you know, falling behind or whatever, I wouldn't be able to hit it. And also, while I can multi dot the sheep and get full damage with that, I'm never going to be able to reliably hit the sheep with my Shadow Flame. It's just way too small of a hitbox. So realistically it's good in dungeons where all the mobs are clumped up but on most most reasonable boss fights that have multiple targets you can dot spread cleave you cannot really get value out of shadow flame so in this situation demonic knowledge will still be best and i think most of the talents here are pretty self-explanatory you got the core stuff here i of course go into all of the deep detail on this in my four hour video which i'm not going to repeat myself here uh, i will note that I do believe that taking Ember Storm and buffing Searing Pain and Immolation Aura is going to be more damage than whatever else you could run. Uh, I do not think taking the 10% damage from Master Demonologist is worth it because you lose everything else, right? It It's just a massive sacrifice because then you're also losing Imp. There's just, you lose way too much going down here. Before the advantage was you get Soul Link and now your survivability is taken care of so you feel more comfortable building for damage. Now, what's the point? Just build for damage. So that's what I'm doing in this build. Uh, you will not be casting Immolate. And one of the nice things about dual talent spec is you can specialize builds more and you don't need to worry about towing the line between like having a build that can do AoE really well and is kind of okay for single target. Now you can just say, hey, I'm not pressing Immolate. Fuck improved Immolate. I'm just never going to press this. Just take Destructive Reach because this is not a damage concern here. So this gives you a bit more flexibility. If like a, a target is far away, you can refresh your uh corruption with like a long range searing pain so pretty good there and i think overall this is going to get you the most damage and it's definitely going to get you the most survivability the only thing that if you want to maximize your survivability with this build i guess what you could do is this and just do that i don't think that's worth it i mean maybe a little bit of extra stamina you're losing a lot of fire damage but I think at a certain point, unless the fight is like consistently killing you, like Menagerie is a pretty scary fight. Maybe that would be something you'd want to consider there, but you're already going to have a lot of stamina. You're going to have your imp. You have three out of three and improved imps. So you're going to have a better blood pact. And yeah, not much else to say. Uh, when we look at the gearing, uh, I mentioned this briefly, but 4%, two out of five in suppression is going to be required with the best in slot gear list that I have. But in most reasonable gear lists, this is what you can expect. There are some gear choices that you can run that would only require you to have one out of five in suppression, but for reasons that I will explain later, I just do not think those gear choices are worth running. And effectively, what are you getting out of this point? 3% stamina? You know, it's this is just better. It's harder to get 2% hit than it is 3% stamina. So it's better to just put the point here, and then if you want more health... There are slots in the BIS list that you can swap around to get tankier pieces. This is just better. Um, and realistically, I guess the advantage of getting hit on your gear is that it wouldn't be just for affliction, but the vast majority of our stuff here is going to be uh, like affliction spells, corruption, um, whatchamacallit, Curse of Agony, blanked on the name there. 
a lot of other stuff. It really, it's just Shadow Bolt, or Shadow Cleave, and uh, Searing Pain. But as we will see later, it is way too difficult to consistently get 5% hit. So it's better to just say, fuck it. Sometimes my Searing Pains are going to miss, but at least none of my dots will ever miss. Unless you obviously still have that 1 in 100 chance of a dot resisting, or any spell resisting for that matter in Classic. It's just a thing that can happen. Um, I will note you could take Master Chandler here if you wanted to, nothing stopping you. It will, of course, be notably less damage, but you can take it. And I believe, yeah, this is the Master Chandler build. So this, I do not recommend this for damage, but I guess maybe if you are looking for a Master Chandler setup, you could go with what I'm going to recommend here. But this is effectively just the same thing as before, but you tailor it for dungeon running. So I would actually say this is more of a leveling build or like a level 50 dungeon farming build than it is uh, like raid. Like this is sunken temple spread cleave boss fights where you want to maximize your damage and threat while still having good survivability. In which case, if you need more survivability, literally just make this one change and then don't change anything else. Like I would not recommend dropping a ton of stuff here just to take improved drain life. For raids, you should have enough healers to keep you up. You should not need improved drain life. If you're taking Master Channeler, that should be more than enough as an added survivability bonus. But obviously, while you're leveling, when your healer has other stuff to worry about, and, you know, especially if you're casting Hellfire, while leveling, always take Master Channeler. Demonic Tactics is good damage, but, I mean, for dungeon content, for solo content, definitely take Master Channeler. It's a no-brainer, right? Um, and here, I'm assuming you're doing dungeon farming or, like, big mob farming out in the open world primarily with a group like maybe dream uh, nightmare incursions i don't know exactly what it's going to look like but it could be good there uh so i do have shadow flame on this setup so just th keep in mind that if you are running this build swap off infernal pact essence and you'll notice i have eight points unspent because this is the core kit right it's the same thing that we saw before but obviously two points in intensity now i do not think running full hellfire stuff is good so I do not think playing around it is what you should do. You should not be running like Incinerate. Obviously now Lake of Fire is dead, which is one of the reasons this build is, the Hellfire build is even more dead. I will probably make a main channel video like in a few days after phase three is out about like dungeon farming, which one is better and talk about why Hellfire is not good. I thought about making that video in P2, but I wanted to wait and I'm glad I did because a lot of stuff has changed. But the only reason that you're putting two points in intensity here is because it's either that or Destructive Reach or Improved Firebolt, which are not amazing, right? And, like, obviously you could, oh, well, I get a chance to stun the target. I do not think putting two points in Pyroclasm is worth it, but you can, I suppose. Um, I would say that if you're running this build, personally, the way that I am going to be doing it for leveling... Just give me a moment here, I need to look at something um i'm going to say put three more points in suppression because the thing about suppression is this does help your hit chance against higher level mobs so while you're leveling up right you know you want to increase your chance so at low levels you won't need this which is why i think the build that i'm talking about here uh i would say is roughly what you're going to want to put i think I don't know exactly what I'm going to talk about in my other video, the main channel video, but I'm probably going to recommend this is what I've been leaning towards. I think this is a good setup. This gives you all the really crucial talents and it gives you enough hit chance for anything at your own level because you will pretty much always have 1% hit from pieces on your gear, maybe even 2% hit. And then as you level up, I would say your first point or two, depending on what you're doing, should probably be into suppression, put like two points into suppression, get like four out of five. Then you're like, oh, okay, you know, maybe I want to put two more points in improved imp because that is good. You get the additional uh, blood pact bonus for the stamina and then probably put the final point in suppression because you'll be doing like Zul Farak, you'll be entering Maradon soon-ish. You can maybe wait until 48 when you enter Maradon to put that final point in. And then you have some added flexibility. I would say... Getting to Emberstorm is probably pretty good here, if you want to, because you could take two out of two in Destructive Reach. You even need the, yeah, you do need the second one. And then now you have three points to put into Emberstorm, just a bit of extra fire damage, what's not to love. Like I said, you could take Pyroclasm, but I don't really think this is good, because 
you don't you're not going to be using rain of fire heavily in this build um the thing about this setup especially now with shadow flame right is honestly like hellfire spam doesn't become good unless you're fighting it's like seven seven plus mobs you need a lot of mobs for hellfire to start outscaling because at a certain point obviously juggling corruption becomes impossible i would say six dots six corruptions is where it becomes really really difficult to keep them all up with uh everlasting affliction anything below that just juggle your corruptions apply if a mob has a lot of health throw a curse of agony on it you're probably going to get most of the value out of that keep master channeler up now you have shadow flame another button to press it does have a i believe a 15 second cooldown right um i don't know if i can see the ability on here fucking blizzard doesn't or wowhead doesn't show it uh really we're just not gonna i don't know okay i i'm 99 sure it's a 15 second cooldown but anyways it's another thing that you can press so you have a lot of abilities that you can press to do damage and the only reason hellfire is here is for specifically pulls with very large mob density that the mobs are weak because one of the other issues with hellfire is it fucking kills you right so you don't want to just sit there spamming hellfire and like you know if the the mobs push it back you have to cast it again it really is not that good to justify killing yourself over and then your healer can't help out whatsoever so the situations where you want to run this are like zool for rock zombies is like okay press hellfire uh, the little mobs leading up to Crowd Pummeler, like I talked about earlier in Nomergon, if you're doing Nomergon for experience, press Hellfire. Cool. Uh, that's nice to have it for. So in those situations, right, where you have a lot of mobs and you want to establish threat on like eight targets really quickly, just quickly press Hellfire, do a bunch of big pulses of damage. You'll be hitting all of them. You'll get like a lot of threat right out of the gate. And unless you have con Concentration Aura to completely negate pushback, which you may, you may not. If you do, cool, you can continue channeling it until you start to die. And obviously, you still want to keep up some corruption dots. So you want to channel that a little bit, then Shadow Cleave, keep up Master Channeler, um, Shadow Flame, obviously, whenever it's off cooldown. So you're not going to be just sitting there channeling it. Uh, but if you don't have a Paladin, then whenever you get pushed back enough, because if there's really high targets, then it will happen sooner rather than later, well, then you just do exactly what I described, except now you can jump right back into it instead of having to like manually cancel it and do that stuff. And it's not a bad thing to have in your back pocket, but I think a lot of people just start like spamming Hellfire on four targets and no, 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 don't. So I, I worry about including intensity here because I feel like people are going to get the wrong idea, but intensity is literally just here because like what other points are you going to spend? Right. Um, in fact, personally, I think if you want to spend five points here, right? Just a demonic embrace. No, extra stamina while leveling can't hurt. You can take improved drain life, but realistically speaking, I would say if you're not taking demonic embrace, what do you need improved drain life for? You know, your healer is just going to give you way more passive healing than you're really going to get from improved drain life. So if you're running both, fine, I guess right like you know maybe drop some points in here if you if you're only doing dungeons at level and you're not like sneaking your way into dungeons before you're ready which for the record is why suppression is good this is assuming that you're doing dungeons slightly under leveled which in many cases you will be you're not going to want to do dungeons while they're red but if like the final boss is orange well then having suppression here really helps you out you do not want to have your master channeler get resisted that really sucks or if you're fighting like high level mobs out in the open world you know, level 44s and stuff, and you're only level 40, then this is pretty good. So that's why I said put points in this early, just get that out of the way, get it sorted. But if you are only doing things at level, and you want to go like, bam, slam five points into here, and then the last three, well, I don't really care about hit chance, and I don't really care about added damage, so I'm just going to take improved drain life, right? Like, that is, that is an option. These are all options that you have. Um, but there is a reason why when I initially put this here i left eight points out because this is the core this is what you want to run frankly if we want to be more particular about it this is the core this is your starting template 
for leveling and you're going to fill them in. Um, most likely, like I said, I've probably already talked about this in, you know, or at least gone over it briefly in my main channel video. That's kind of the entire point. I want to talk about this leveling build and mostly I want to talk about Everlasting Affliction and, you know, why it's better than Hellfire Spam. That's going to be the crux of that video. I'm going to try to basically take a lot of the concepts that I've discussed here in a lot more detail and summarize them really succinctly and bam, 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 get that information out to people. Uh, I need to hurry because I it's 8.30 and... Well, I haven't slept, so I need to find a time to get the video done, get it posted, and maybe sleep at this point. I might just not. Uh, and I also had other stuff I wanted to do in-game to prep, so... Um, and this is not a build that I recommend, but I wanted to at least give a courtesy demonology mention. As I said, I do not suspect Felguard will be good even for Demo, unfortunately. I just don't, don't see it, right? Like... Why would you run it? So realistically speaking, if you're taking Demo, it's because, I, I don't know, you like Succubus <laughs> um, and you like the idea of Master Demonologist. There is no reason to run this build. This is like, this is, I hate Fire Destro, which frankly, yeah, I can, I can relate to that, right? If you hate the playstyle of Fire Destro, you hate the cast stuff. And obviously the more dot focused Everlasting Affliction build doesn't really work on single target unless you want to really try to play heavily into that snapshotting setup that I discussed in my four hour long video. But as I said, I do not think that will be viable. You can try it if you want. I'm hopeful that one day, maybe at level 60, it ends up being good because um, something that I, I probably won't talk about a lot in this in the best in slot videos, but is worth mentioning is they did change Zila Gular. Instead of being 100 additional damage, it's now a 25% damage amp, which is, I think, roughly equal at current level in terms of like how this impacts our corruption. But what this does mean is that corruption will scale much better with Zeola Gular later into the game. So at level 60, who knows? If we get a lot more support for that corruption snapshotting playstyle, this is a trinket that we could still see ourselves using well into the sod end game at 60 so i think that's interesting but i think that means we're not really going to take a look at that build just yet so the way that i view this build is this is this is what i like to call simp warlock your um previously was nice because you could be super tanky and play simp warlock build and now you can't now you're you're just simp warlock so this is frankly a better off tank build than it is a main tank build and it's much more reliable if you're not going for parses because you're not going to get the most damage out of this but what this does do is it lets you cover multiple targets pretty well you have you know obviously ammo aura for the 10 percent magic dr and you have pandemic plus improved corruption for the instant cast on you know farming mobs on aoe if you're doing trash and stuff like that you have 5 out of 5 improved Shadow Bolt because presumably if you're running this build, you are going to want to press Shadow Cleave on single target to apply this debuff. So you can buff maybe the other Warlocks in your group or if you have a Shadow Priest, this is obviously very, very nice for them. So it is obviously a damage loss personally to press Shadow Cleave on single target to keep this buff up, but that's kind of the point of this build. That's why I call it Simp Warlock. And... The big one here is, of course, Demonic Pact, right? So Demonic Pact, if you want to run Demonic Pact, because it is a very powerful buff, right? You know, giving your party spell damage, then this is a setup you can use. Now, keep in mind, you could literally just take this, swap this for Demonic Pact. It's a relatively negligible personal damage loss, and it buffs your party. So I would say if... All you care about is Demonic Pact, just Demonic Pact, just run this build, drop Incinerate for Demonic Pact, and then just spam Searing Pain. That's it. But the nice thing about this is it's a lot more flexible. It also provides Improved Shadow Bolt. If you want to give your group Improved Health Stones, you can do that if you um, want. And I left the chest rune empty because it's up to you. Uh, Demonic Tactics is obviously more personal damage, but more importantly, I actually think this has the value of you're increasing your pet's crit chance by 10%. And since Demonic Pact procs off your pet's critical strikes, then 
you're increasing the chance for this to be applied. Keep in mind, though, that, like, if your pet crits, they your party members get Demonic Pact for 45 seconds. So you don't really need Demonic Tactics if all you care about is keeping uptime. You're probably going to get close to 100% uptime regardless, but worth noting. And if you are, like, main tanking with this and you just want more survivability, then Master Channel are pretty straightforward. But it's less important because the idea of this is already that you do not care about your personal damage. But really rip Soul Link because something like this, obviously you would, you can't really run this. But like if we had Soul Link back, you would take this. Um, can you? Yeah, you can take one point out. Uh, yeah, you would take this and you would then put like one more point here because then you would want to run the AOE stuff. And then you would have like three points left that you could put anywhere. You could put that in like, I don't know, improve life tap and maybe slight mana cost reduction. Well, actually, I guess you would probably want to put it three out of three. Well, you could peel this off as much as possible. Um... Yeah, probably just put 5 out of 5 there and then maybe take one improved life tap or something. This would be an amazing build. I wish we could play this, unfortunately, as we already know we can't. I'm still holding on to hope that Blizzard walks back what they did to Soul Link because it's just a really fucking stupid change. And it especially feels insulting given that they didn't give us a reason why. They just torched the build and then said nothing. So, that sucks. Um, anyways, that's it for best in slot builds. I, I gave like a lot of variation during my four hour video because I wanted to cover all my bases with Demo being dead. It's a little bit more straightforward, but I personally think this is a really safe bet. Really don't see anything else being viable for single target sunken temple bosses, unfortunately. And this is, I would say a very safe bet for AOE as well for damage. There's really not any other damage options the only consideration i made is instead of going down into ember storm you could go down into improved curse of agony because that's like a little bit more aoe damage but i think realistically speaking searing pain plus immolation aura is more of an overall percentage of our damage compared to just uh curse of agony not to mention if we are using utility curses like uh curse of shadow then this gives us nothing and we have to take a lot of points here that we don't really love, because if we're not running Master Channeler, then what are we going to do? Just take extra hit chance that we don't need? We're spending dead points here to get stuff. Well, like, you could say that Destructive Reach is a dead point from a damage standpoint. This still gives us really good utility, so it's really nice to have. And not much else here is worth taking. Because if we're going fire damage, then going for Ember Storm is much more important than going down for like fell intellect or something so i really don't see anything else being competitive for aoe the only thing i will note quickly is because i'm sure somebody's going to ask and i already talked about it a little bit in my previous build but i've seen a lot of people like going crazy over it nightfall's not good and i just want to be clear on that nightfall the main thing about this is it's nice that it now gives us something instead of nothing but just to reiterate the amount of cdr that you're going to get on shadow cleave from this is trivial and even if you do get a reset on Shadow Cleave, in builds like this, you already have so many buttons to press. So what are you going to do? Like in a situation like this, for instance, where you're tanking dungeons and you are trying to do AOE damage, right? Well, you already have, you're juggling your corruption uh, refreshes. And you could argue that having a slight cooldown reduction on... Um, uh, on Shadow Cleave would help to keep those up, and it does do pretty good damage if you're hitting three targets, but to to take that, you're losing just so much. I just, I don't see it being worth it. Because, like, to take it, you would need what? Like, as you take three points and improve drain life, you would take maybe two more points, and since we're leveling up, we put points in suppression, and then you take this, I guess is how you would justify that. And then what, you're losing out on two out of three in improved imp. So less stamina, less damage. You're losing out on the added range. You're losing out on Ember Storm for the Immolation Aura damage and the Searing Pain damage. Is that going to be worth it? No, it's just not. 
even if you were consistently getting like complete resets, like you shadow cleave and then it immediately refreshes itself, that just, it's not worth it. It would not be more damage. Just no. Uh, I wanted to at least mention that because like I said, I'm sure somebody is going to ask me. So now let's quickly talk about best in slot gear. Uh, there's only one real thing that I want to talk about. Uh, I want to mention, we're going to look at this. And uh, there's a lot of familiar things here, so you'll notice a lot of the same things. Um, one thing I want to note is that we can reliably reach 5% hit, which is hit cap. So all of these builds are aiming to reach 5% hit. So for instance, getting the hit from this necklace is going to be nice because it is one of the easier ways to reach it over Jindo's Lost Locket. And I'll kind of explain... Basically, a lot of the different variations. I have three variations here. Uh, Fire, Malev, and No Malev, which refers to the tier set bonus, and then Shadow with Malevolent. Um, and I'll kind of go into more about what that means. So some reoccurring things here. We saw this helmet before. This is the best helmet that you can get unless you're running Eye of Flame or one of the random things with of Fiery Wrath. This is with... The Malevolent Prophet set, the only reliable thing that you can use to get hit, and it's not bad, right? So you're probably going to want to run it. And on that note, I think actually to really explain why this build is designed the way it is, we need to talk about Malevolent Prophet set. So this is the biggest change, right? Obviously, we had stuff like the Blade of Eternal Darkness change. We had... Um, a few very minor tweaks to itemization and some new dungeon items, which didn't rock the boat too much, but Malevolent Prophet's Chest, this used to have, uh, whatchamacallit, and it, this one always had 1% crit, I believe, but the boots used to have 1% hit, if you look at my previous video, it now has 1% crit, and you'll notice the two set bonus is now 1% crit instead of 1% hit. So previously, both Nightmare Prophets and Malevolent Prophets had a two-piece for 1% hit, just like the Nomergon set bonus, and the boots here had hit, which was really nice. Now they don't. Now this set is 3% crit, which is really rough, because getting hit cap without the set bonuses is... You have to sacrifice a lot of stuff. So you'll notice I'm taking some stuff here that I didn't have on my BIS lists before, because now you can't reliably reach hit cap. And this really fucking blows. And one of the other things is they changed the three-piece bonus to be... Now it's your damage spells have a chance to cause your target to take up to uh, 50 increased damage from subsequent spells. So, about that. If this is a personal bonus... And that three-piece bonus makes it so your target takes 50 increased damage from your spells. This is your best-in-slot build. And it's pretty straightforward. It's really rigid. Because if we want to reach hit cap reliably without sacrificing much, and you're, you're not really sacrificing too much here. Definitely nothing that getting hit cap isn't worth for. Um, but you are sacrificing a little bit. But if it's... A sacrifice so that you can get this ludicrously powerful three-piece bonus of your target just takes 50 increased damage. Like, if this just makes all your spells hit 50 damage harder, that's really good. <laughs> it's really, really good. Uh, and it has a really high uptime from what I've seen. Like, I don't know exactly, but I suspect it'll be close to 100% uptime on this buff. Because it lasts quite a while uh what i don't know though is if the buff gets consumed so if it's like it because it says subsequent spells and it has i believe a 45 second duration something really long but it might be like the moment it consumes the plus 50 effect then it goes away we can't really see that i don't see anything to indicate that and the real kicker here the problematic thing is that based on the current spell effect attached to this bonus it is just a flat damage mod for everyone. So all similar things that will just buff the damage that any player does, not just you, to the target, this has a similar spell effect. And stuff like Haunt, which increases your shadow damage dealt, or your damage over time shadow stuff, that has a personal player damage done. 
This does not. So I suspect that this three piece bonus is just a utility thing that anybody can apply. And if you have one of them, it does not stack. It would be obviously stupidly overpowered if this stacked. There is no way that this three piece bonus stacks because then you would just stack casters because obviously what would happen is the more casters you had, the more buffs of this you would get and then it would snowball, right? Exponential scaling. So it definitely doesn't do that. That should be a no brainer. So it either is a personal damage buff or it is one person applies it and everybody gets the benefit. And considering there are already other set bonuses like the rogue one, which give everybody else a benefit, and we know that for sure, well, it stands to reason that this could be the same. So right now it is, right? The spell effect does that. The only question is, is that a mistake? Either Wowhead has it wrong or Blizzard put the wrong thing on there and they'll change it, or maybe they will nerf it if they think it's overpowered, or is it actually going to be like that? Because if it is actually going to be like that, then we just will not take this set bonus. Flat out. Because there are way better combinations that we can run. Or really, there is a better combination that we can run, as I'll show later. It's the other set that I have on here. And there are many other classes that want crit more than us. Well, I say many other. Mage wants crit more than us. Like, Fire Mage is going to prefer this set. And the other thing is Mage doesn't have any alternatives. So we have another set, which is also shit, unfortunately. The individual pieces on that other set, as we will see, the Nightmare Prophets one, they are buffed. They have been reworked. They are much better than they were in terms of itemization. But we have a new three-piece bonus on the Nightmare Prophets set that is quite literally a damage loss to play around. So... We either run Malevolent Prophets three-piece. If this is personal damage, this is definitely what we take because the other three-piece bonus is a damage loss. But if this is something that somebody else can provide and we still get the benefit, then we don't want to run this. It is a damage loss then for us to apply this buff. And if we have another mage in our group who can just apply that for us, we would rather do that. In fact, I would actually argue that until you get the other gear slot that, I would, that I'm going to recommend, it is better to just let somebody else in your raid get the new three-piece, and then you just keep on hyperconductive and benefit from that really high uptime, massive spell power proc that can happen from the, the hyperconductive three-piece, especially because that gear is still pretty good. There are better options individually here, but it's not so far behind that you wouldn't want to keep it for quite a while, especially if you don't want to run this anyways. But it's... It's tricky because I suspect that these are just going to be tier token options, right? So I think we're just going to want to get the tier pieces anyways, but something to consider, right? Um, but yeah, th this, it sucks. Uh, the stats on it aren't terrible. Like the individual stats, right, on these boots are actually quite good. 1% crit, 15 spell damage and healing. It's actually outside of irradiated, which doesn't fucking count. Um, and that's only because the hit chance, which there are other ways to get hit chance, right? Uh, this is the best single pair of boots this phase. Really good itemization, it's just unfortunate it's attached to this set, which they've fucked. And, like, the pants are kind of, eh, they're fine. Um, the chest obviously has good stats, but there are other options, like the Nightmare Prophets one. And... This is what effectively this build is based around. In the situation where this is a personal damage buff, then yes, this will be worth playing around. And in which case, we have no hit from this, so we need to get hit elsewhere. So where do we find our hit? Well, we get our hit from this helmet. We get our hit from this necklace. We get our hit from the belt. And the belt is guaranteed. All of our belts this phase will give us hit. We're either going to take this one from the raid, we're going to take Banthok Sash, or we're going to take Valdo Concoction Belt. You should not be running any other belt. It is such an easy way to get hit, and all of these have amazing itemization. So that's guaranteed for sure. And then we want to take Breath of the Beast. This is a trinket that I mentioned before. They buff this for some reason. Previously, this was just 1% hit, which was already pretty good. Now it's just 1% crit and 1% hit. This is just disgusting. Um, I don't know why they did this, because now every single person is going to want this trinket, and it's going to be like a best-in-slot option pretty much like for most of this game, unless they just release something that gives us 2% crit and 2% hit later on. it's This is just such a flexible trinket that at the current stage, the game has a ludicrous power level relative to everything else. So this is now 
broken. And Adelai Blood Ritual Charm is still really good. So we're going to take this over other options. But now we still need one more percent hit. And this means we're going to have to take Drake Claw Band of the Juggernaut. Now, one of the nice things is this is the tanking ring. And I mentioned in my previous video that there could be like this concern of, oh, do you take the spell damage and healing ring or do you take the tanking ring? Like, let's say that these are from the quest at the end of the raid and you can only pick one. Well, I can tell you right now, you're pretty much always going to pick the tanking ring because not only is this now, it is the tankiest ring that you can find for sure. So from a survivability standpoint, it's good, but it's just better for damage. <laughs> um, it's one of the only reliable ways to get hit chance now for all builds, just because they gimp the hit chance on our tier set bonus. So we can't get it reliably from there now. And it's, it's just kind of mandatory. So if this is a quest item, I would say definitely take the Juggernaut Band. You don't even really need to think about it. You have better options for the um, the other rings. One of the other things, right, is you'll notice I'm running the uh, Blood Moon Ring here. I mentioned before that one of the potential problems with the Blood Moon Ring is that Infernal Pact Essence could still be a strong contender. But now, because our Trinket slots are locked in, right, these are both ridiculously good... You obviously won't want to use this until you get new trinkets, because until you get new trinkets on single target, you're going to be running Demonic Knowledge, you're going to want to run Infernal Pact Essence, but you're eventually going to replace it now because these are just so ridiculously powerful, which means now you're very easily able to take the Blood Moon Ring, so for a pure fire damage build, this is just really good. It is kind of a toss-up, this or Songstone of Ironforge. Songstone obviously giving you more damage in the form of a bit more intellect and one more spell damage and healing, but I would say if you are going for a pure fire damage build where you do not care about the magic spells and effects, and of course, if you are not running Demonic Pact, where obviously if you are playing a Demonic Pact setup, then everything needs to be spell damage and healing because it scales off of your spell damage and healing. So you do not want to be running this. You do not want to be running this. I already talked about these items in my previous video. They're Green of Fiery Wrath BOEs, not much to say. Uh, obviously, you only want to run this if you are running Incinerate, because otherwise you want your spell damage to scale. But uh, this is better for survivability, because it has significantly more stamina. Like, it has a ton of stamina. This Songstone doesn't even have stamina, so this is way more health, and still really good damage. Losing one spell power for... That much additional stamina is absolutely a worthy trade-off if you are only doing fire damage. And um, really, that's the main thing. Be we're forced into this. The other stuff you'll probably recognize it was either on the previous list or it's just there for hit. Like this is, it's either one of these two necklaces. You run this if you you run run this if you want hit. You run this if you don't need the hit. And yeah. Um. Hope we don't need to run this setup this is like a disaster situation i guess if the three piece bonus is good the three piece bonus is good but i really hope that they actually don't change it because one of the problems with this is you just can't really move around any of these oh i bumped my desk there sorry if that made a lot of noise uh you can't really change around any of these slots right they're kind of locked in um obviously if you don't have blade of eternal darkness run like modus carcoon or something or just run gizmo blade gizmo blade's perfectly fine uh, but really, you, you need to run all the hit chance stuff. There is no other reliable way to get hit chance. I I really don't think there's anything else that you could run if you are getting this three-piece bonus. The, actually, there is one thing you could run, and that is Enthralled Spear, but Enthralled Spear is not worth taking over Drakestone. It's just not. The other options are much better. Like, I guess, what would you take over Drake, like this for fire damage is so much better in terms of raw damage compared to like you're losing what 12 spell damage and healing from this and you're losing from enthralled spear to drake stone this is 30 fire damage and this is just eight so you're losing 22 fire damage if you get your hit here obviously discounting the int and this to this you're only losing 12 and this to Eye of Flame, you're losing... I guess if you have Eye of Flame, it's what? Um, 22? 
So it's uh it's exactly the same as on here, 22. Uh, but obviously most people won't have Eye of Flame. Most people will have green lens. They're not going to shell out for this. So realistically, it's just 21 to 36, in which case this is a more cost-effective trade-off. Uh, you could argue if you want like if you want more survivability, you could go something like this, Green Lens of Fiery Wrath, and then Enthralled Sphere, because then you're getting the 10 stamina from this, because the Visage of the Exiled doesn't have any stamina on it, so it's slightly less tanky, but it really doesn't matter. That's maybe the only flexible choice you have here. Everything else is just kind of locked in. I mentioned the ring, yeah. Um, I guess Kentic Amis, you could, if you want, right? It doesn't really matter. You could take Synthetic Mantle. That's like kind of a personal choice if you want that uh, additional survivability. But here, like Huku's Hex Cape is not worth it. Once again, unless you are running Demonic Pact. If you're running Demonic Pact, this is your Biss. If you're running Demonic Pact, then once again, uh, Earth Warder's Gloves would be your Biss. And in that case, obviously, you don't really care about the intellect because you're trying to buff other people. So stacking on as much spell power as possible would be good. In which case, once again, you'd want Kentagamas. Uh, but I think we've talked about that enough. Uh, we're already going to hit the two-hour mark, which is way more than I thought this was going to take. Fuck my life. Um, so, no malevolent. This is assuming what I believe is going to happen, where it is a universal buff that applies to everybody, and this is what your stuff's going to look like. You're going to take, obviously, Eye of Flame. If you don't have Eye of Flame, just take Green Lens of Fiery Wrath, right? Um... And it, you're still probably going to run this necklace, honestly. Because this is still a very effective way to get hit. You're only losing 12 spell damage and healing, which is the least um, unfortunate trade-off here. And now I guess we should talk about Nightmare Prophet. Because you'll notice almost everything else is the same. The only difference is now you don't need the hit. So you could, if you wanted to, run Songstone. It is a better trade-off because you're getting 18 spell damage and healing, right? Everything else is the same. Breath of the Beast is just such a good way to get hit. You're going to want to run this whenever possible. Same with your belt. And the main change here has been the, the set bonus. So this gives you 1% hit on the chance still, or 1% hit chance on the chest still, and you're only losing three spell damage and healing compared to the Malevolent Prophet set, and the two-piece still gives you hit, so you want to pair it with... Um, one of the other items, and obviously, as I said before, Nightmare Prophet Sandals is... Or, oh, blah, blah, blah. Um, I said before that Malevolent Prophet Sandals is the single best item. Nightmare Prophet Sandals is not bad. It is 20 spell damage and healing versus 1% crit and 15 spell damage and healing. Now, this is better by a decent amount. 1% crit is worth a little bit. I don't necessarily know if the exact rankings here I would agree with in terms of like the values, but like definitely Irradiated Boots, this weight's it way too high. Uh, but this is still a pretty close call. The main reason why you're not running Malevolent Prophets, which if you had to look at all three pieces and say which was the biggest difference, well, these pants are 23 and the pants in our set bonus to complete the two piece are only 21. So you might say, well, why not run chest and pants? Because obviously you're going to want to run the chest because the chest has hit. That's critical to this setup. You want to maximize your hit chance from easily obtainable items. And here, well, we're only losing two spell damage compared to the other set bonus by running these pants. That seems pretty good, right? Uh, ignoring the survivability stats, we're like, if, if you wanted to maximize survivability, you would just take this. But we're trying to optimize damage here. You know, maximize survivability, who fucking cares? Just slap on... Uh, as much stamina as you want. I can't change your mind. Obviously, if you're watching this video, you're probably trying to min-max your damage. But while you may be getting slightly uh, more value from, like, the tier set swap from pants, because obviously, you know, the boots are significantly better here uh, relative to it, the other items that you can run, namely the Of Fiery Wrath pants, are much stronger. 36 fire damage. So, this is definitely the better combo for damage. The Fiery Wrath Pants gives you a huge helping of fire damage. And while these are a slightly less efficient way to get the set bonus than if you were to run Malevolent Profits and take the Pants, um, overall, when you average out like how much you're losing with this setup, you're gaining more fire damage with this setup than you would with the alternative of the 1% crit boots 
and stuff. Uh, but you could do that, right? Like, this is still perfectly fine if you have... Um, if you get the, the tier pants, if you get, like, tier chest, tier pants, and you want to run, like, literally anything else, doesn't even matter, right? You could even run, like, hyperconductive walkers. This would still be worth it just because this gets you uh, the 2% hit. And that's the main thing you care about. So you still 5% hit. You still have all the hit you need. All you want to do is make sure that you get your set bonus online as soon as possible. Uh, chest you definitely want. The only thing is, like, if somebody else is actually going to run tier pants in your raid... It's kind of troll to roll on it just to be like, hey, I want boots, but in the meantime, can I take these pants just because it is a marginal upgrade that I will eventually replace? That's kind of fucked. Just let somebody else get their three piece and just, I would say, wait to get the boots, but, you know, to each their own. And the only other thing worth discussing here is Eye of Flame. Frankly, one of the bigger advantages of this setup is that it does free you up room to take Eye of Flame, but even if you aren't taking Eye of Flame, it still does let you take Green Lens. As I said before, you could run Green Lens and then take Enthralled Sphere, but with this setup, you can run Green Lens and Drakestone, which is obviously very good. So, overall, this is just the better damage setup. The survivability is actually closer than you may suspect, right? Like, this has 1,400 armor, this has 3,400 health, this is... I have buffs over here like powered fortitude and this is 3400 armor 13 or 3400 health and uh 1300 armor which um this is slightly more armor this is slightly more health but not by a significant margin so frankly tankiness wise they're about the same maybe the only good thing about this set is that if you really 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 wanted to you could you could tweak this set more, because, like, you could take Songstone, you could slap on the um, Band of the Juggernaut, right? You could take uh, take your Cloak. I mean, there aren't really any good stamina options here. Gloves, also not really any good stamina options here. Um, but you could take... Crap. Um, I don't know, Synthetic Mantle. You could do that in the other set. Really, I guess it's just the... Um, just the gloves. But the, one of the big things right here is, so you're taking Nightmare Prophet sandals, and here we're saying that for damage you're running this, but if you do want to take this and run, like, uh, what would be the biggest stamina item? Biggest stamina, I believe, would just be these, right? Now we're starting to get, like, a little bit further ahead, right? If we compare this, now you're getting 200 additional health. Now, do I think 200 additional health is worth losing all that extra damage for? No. A lot of people go way too crazy about survivability and like, what if the bosses hit really hard? Well, I'll tell you what right now, if the bosses are hitting hard, 200 stamina is not going to be the difference between life or death, right? At that point, that is such a marginal difference that with this gear set, you should be able to survive everything. Survivability is only really a concern if you're running an excessively greedy setup, which this is not. Mind you, this is not an excessively greedy setup by any means. Um, and, or if you are very undergeared entering a raid, should not be a problem, you know, and the only time where you're really at a concern, like concern where 200 stamina could matter is if your healers are just asleep. Generally speaking, unless something is a one shot and you just literally need the stamina to live through it, in which case, I, I mean, <laughs> that's going to be insane if somehow 3,400 stamina is not enough. And we suddenly need to start stacking on stamina gear just over everything just to be able to live. At that point, you're just not going to run a Warlock tank, right? Uh, if abilities are hitting that hard, or you're going to run defensive things like the Druids can now use Ironbark as an external, or you're going to tell your Priest to run Pain Suppression and put it on you if things are doing that much damage. But if something isn't a one-shot and you have enough stamina to survive it either way, then your healers just need to heal you. And if your healers are not healing you, well, then that's their problem. It, they should not be telling you, ah, uh, you know, sacrifice all of your damage to get an extra, you know, 200, 300 health so that I can, like, pick my nose for a second longer before I cast the heal on you. No, fuck off. Heal the tank. But generally speaking, that shouldn't be a concern. I think people just way overvalue a slight amount of additional armor, or stamina, etc. in most cases. This is going to get you most of the way there. Like, even if you're running, what, like, let's say Modus Carcoon... Modus Carcoon in this, you're getting 400 extra health, I guess. 
right? If you really want to, if you really care about, you know, survivability that much, you're not losing too much damage taking this. You're only losing, like... I, the Blade of Eternal Darkness proc is obviously a big hit, but you're losing maybe, like, 20, 30 fire damage. And who knows how much damage DPS the, uh, the Blade proc is, but shouldn't be a big concern. And finally, last thing as I end this two-hour video, is the Shadow Damage setup. So the Shadow Damage setup, uh, one of the nice things about this is because of Suppression, we can very easily reach 5% hit with all the Shadow stuff that matters. And as I mentioned before when looking over Talents, there's no real point in stacking all that hit, right, just to be able to make your Searing Pain and Shadow Cleave have a slightly higher hit chance. Most of your important spells are going to have hit cap already, so you're going to get severe diminishing returns from that added hit. So it's better to just take the easy points in suppression and then just build for uh, damage. And one of the nice things about the shadow setup is that because we have pandemic now, which benefits from crit for all our dots, uh, we want crit. And because we don't care about hit, it doesn't matter that this set has 3% uh, crit instead of hit. So we just run malevolent profits. You know, I've already looked at everything, but you can see, um, this is not valuable because we don't need the hit. So this is the best piece in that uh, slot. Uh, this is better than a shadow damage, obviously, because this is only plus three, but we're still using fire stuff, Immo Aura, and Searing Pain. So we want spell damage whenever possible. Uh, not always feasible to get uh, spell damage. Sometimes shadow is just better. And of course, we mentioned before that these boots are just the best in that particular uh, slot. This is the only situation where running Drake Claw Band of the Harbinger would be good. So obviously, if you are in a situation where this is you can only take one, I would still say don't take Band of the Harbinger just for this build because it's not even that good. You would still want to just take uh, Band of the Juggernaut for tanking in pretty much all situations. If you were not able to access Band of the Harbinger, your best option would be the Shadow Damage Blood Moon Ring, just because if you absolutely need to, you know, you could take that. But, right, if you're going for pure spell damage, maybe because you're running Demonic Pact, or, I don't know, realistically you're not, because realistically this is an Everlasting Affliction build, but you could just take your old rings, like the plus 12 from Lore Keepers would just be good. Or, I mean, if you really wanted to, Band of the Unicorn, but... I personally wouldn't recommend it. I would say at this point, just take Shadow and it would give you more. But that is why Band of the Harbinger would be best here. You want as much spell damage as possible. So if we can take both, then this would be the one situation where it is useful. And for Trinkets, uh, because we don't need the hit, I it, it's like a little bit hard to say. There's like an honestly argument to be made that you still just take Breath of the Beast just for flat 1% crit. Is flat 1% crit better than... Um, your uh, extra spell damage here i don't know you could also make an argument for modus carcoon or not, not modus carcoon azila gular on a single target right like even if you're on aoe right if you have like a menagerie situation and you put your biggest corruption snapshotted onto like one of the three bosses uh, this could still amount to a sizable chunk of damage over the fight though i suspect if you're hitting three to four targets that raw spell damage would outperform it Kind of hard to say for sure, but you have options here, really. Um, the one thing that you... I guess you could run, in this case, Infernal Pact Essence. The only thing is, like, obviously, if you can't run Band of the Harbinger and you do need to run Eye of the Blood Moon, then you can't run Infernal Pact Essence, which is why I didn't want to put it here, but it is an option if you are running this setup. Uh, potentially a better option, because you'll probably be running your Imp, so you will get slightly more damage out of the additional mana on your Imp. Something to think about. Uh, obviously, Court of the Untamed. Gloves, it doesn't really matter. Either Adelaide Hexer's gloves or Earth Warder's gloves. I don't really think the intellect is more valuable. Personally, I think you just run this, but who knows? And Drake Stone, you, obviously, I would say that taking the shadow damage here, I think we talked about this in the last video, while you do want spell damage, this is still going to give you, in my opinion, more damage overall, because most of your damage will be shadow. Uh, I suspect it's going to be like a 70-30 split. So in this case, you're going to want to run this, and you're going to want to not take Spirit of Aquamentus. But if 
for some reason we end up in like a 50 50 split scenario there could be an argument in favor of just spirit of aquamentus over this just for the flat spell damage hard to say for sure uh blade of eternal darkness duh I already talked about that in pretty extensive detail. Uh, Void Powered Invokers Bracers. Obviously, if you are not engineering, then just take the other ones. Uh, Huku's Hex Cape. I would say that the best Shadow Damage Cape is only plus five spell damage. So I do not think that that is worth losing the Hex Cape for. I think you just run this for any sort of Shadow Damage build. For Shoulders, it's a bit trickier because the best one is plus 29. And the next option is all the way down here at plus 14. So you're getting over 10 shadow spell damage. I think that is probably enough to justify running this if you have it, especially considering these options are not really great survivability pieces in general. If you want one that does solid damage and still gives you good survivability, just take like either one of these two, either the PvP ones or Synthetic Mantle. Really, it doesn't matter too much. Obviously, we don't need the hit, so we're going to take Jindo's Lost Locket. And then for the helmet, it's a tough call. We don't need the hit, so like this is only plus 21. There are better spell damage helmets if we really want it. I can turn off random suffixes if this will click. So if we absolutely do not want um, the shadow damage ones and we want like raw spell damage, I guess you would take spell power goggles extreme plus just for raw spell damage. And the others are like around 22, right? We're not going to run the tailoring helmet in this theoretical situation at 22. So realistically, it's just this. It's it's either spell power goggles, extreme plus, or a plus 36 shadow damage helmet, depending on what the proportion of your damage is shadow to fire. If if we get closer to a 50-50 split, you probably want these. If we are uh, like in the 70-30 that I predict, you'll probably just want the plus 36. One of the nice things about green lens is that you'll be able to use it crafted or craft it level up leveling up engineering i can't speak today apparently um so this does kind of assume that you have engineering which obviously i do i am partially creating these for myself but i also know that most tanks have engineering and realistically speaking very few people in my opinion are going to drop engineering just to take alchemy enchanting and those people probably aren't watching this video anyway because they already know that they are going to be min-maxing and they've probably already done the research for themselves. Uh, but that about covers everything, so that's two hours. I talked a bit longer than I want, but I really don't see much of this changing. Uh, we're, like, all of this is going to go live. Like, keep in mind, if you, you can see the time on the bottom right of my screen, uh, this is SOD P3 launch day. We're not getting any more changes from here on out, unless it's like a post-launch hotfix, but they've already said that they're going to be very conservative with tuning early on, so these are all like covering the most recent things. I think this is pretty much what we can expect, right? And uh, really the big ones here are the Maradon Dagger. We're going to want to farm that a lot, um, and the, the loss of tailoring. Basically, the three main points that I want to cover for gearing is loss of tailoring, Maradon Dagger, and uh the tier set changes and then i kind of just like talked a lot <laughs> outside of that i think if you walk away from this video and remember those three points like keep in mind we need to wait and see how the tier set's going to work we need to farm the mard on dagger if we want to min max our damage and i also farm more song gulch uh daily quests that's going to be pretty good so that'll be very very nice to have um Unfortunately, as you can see, no matter which tier set we pick, our Warlocks are going to end up looking like strippers next phase, so so be it. You know, th there's no transmog in Classic, so we, we gotta live with it. Especially, god, the stripper outfit. I just, I cannot, on a gnome, just doesn't feel right, but it's the price of Biss, right? Hey, I, I might be moving on to Paladin uh, by the time I even see this stuff, so who knows. Um, I'm creating this theoretically, as I said before. I do not expect that I will ever see this gear on my Warlock unless it's like late in the phase and I decide that I want to play it again for P4 and I'm like, I might as well get my uh, like level 50 bis so I'm ready to jump into like level 60 content. But I just cannot see myself really being into uh, Warlock tank in P4. I guess I, I don't, maybe I'll talk about this another time, but I figure, you know, if you watch this far, you're probably you know somewhat interested in what i have to say about warlock tank and a lot of people are like dooming warlocks because of the fire resistance and obviously it will be a little bit rough because there are 
Oh, there's not a lot of fire immune mobs, and a lot of people are like dooming about that, but most of the stuff in Molten Core is fire resistance heavy, not fire immune. And there are some fire immune mobs, and there's a lot of fire immune mobs from what I've heard in Blackwing Lair. Now, Blizzard has said they're not going to make anything immune. They want to give more build diversity, so we are 99% sure that there will be no fire immune mobs, or especially not fire immune bosses, in those raids. However, um, there will be heavy resistances, which will, of course, lower the damage of Fire Warlock. And that's why it just feels so weird to me that they've gimped one of the shadow damage focused builds. Because I was saying for a while that I think Warlocks are going to be just fine in Molten Core and BWL because they have this shadow damage focused playstyle with Soul Link where they have the tankiness and it buffs their damage and they can still do really good threat. And I mean, you can still run a shadow damage heavy setup, but like now you just don't have the survivability to go along with it. Just why? It wasn't wasn't overpowered by any means so it, it just sucks it's a shitty change um i honestly i i don't basically i don't like the direction that they're taking warlock tanks to be honest and i just find it hard to believe that they're going to fully pivot in the span of one phase so from where i'm sitting i think that we're going to be playing the builds I discussed here, which I'm just not a fan of. And at level 60, we're just going to still be playing either a, a shitty shadow damage build just to avoid fire resistances, or we're going to be forced to like strip fire resist and play fire destro again. And they're just going to give us more stuff that plays into fire destro. And it just doesn't sound fun to me. Right? Especially considering, like, the rotation just hasn't fucking changed. You know? Like, one of the things that I really like about, like, the Corruption Snapshotting build or, like, the Everlasting Affliction build is there's a reason why I got... I barely missed rank 1 Menagerie on my first kill, and then I've consistently, like, re and I think right now I'm down to uh, rank 5 Mechanical Menagerie as of, like, the final end of the phase. There's a reason why every single time I did so well, because I am good at that build. I am really good at juggling dots and stuff and managing that shit. And, you know, you have to rotate between the targets. You have to keep up your dots and all of them. You have to, you're using different abilities. Like, okay, my corruption's about to fall off. Throw a searing pain there. Make sure I line up the bosses so that my shadow cleave hits all of them. It's a fun play style that actually requires, in my opinion, a decent amount of skill. And the corruption snapshotting thing seems like a really cool idea. Honestly, the play style might be pretty boring. You might just be spamming searing pain during the fight. But the process of basically setting up that really big corruption setup, all the organization and like buff management that it would require to get to that point, to be able to just put up this massive corruption, I like that idea. That sounds fun. But right now, the playstyle is just stack a bunch of fucking spell power buffs, press incinerate, and then spam searing pain. And I, oh yeah, you throw immolate in there too. That's it, just spam searing pain. Lake of Fire was obviously terrible, and I'm glad it's dead, but... I don't know. So, like, one of the, the nice things, silver linings, is I'm going to have fun leveling my Warlock because I like the Warlock AoE playstyle. And Shadow Flame's a fun ability to press. I liked using it while leveling before I had um, Demonic Knowledge. And then it sucked when it was just terrible and I had to run Demonic Knowledge. So I'm happy that it's back. I'm going to have a lot of fun dungeon grinding. And I know it may seem stupid to farm for Blade of Eternal Darkness if I'm not going to play my Warlock, but you know what? That just sounds fun to me. Like, the idea of spamming Maradon and just doing these big dungeon pulls and just grinding to get this really cool item, who knows? Maybe I, I will enjoy Warlock more than I expect, but I at the very least think I will have fun gearing it up and getting it ready for my guild's raid. And I'm sure I'm going to have fun playing it once or twice in Sunken Temple. But do I really want to go in another 10 weeks of... Hoping that I get perfect... Another thing, Grimoire of Synergy. Fucking dog shit rune. I've said that before. I hate it with a burning passion. It's not fun. And now we need to run Demonic Tactics. And we can't even run Master Chandler, which is one of my favorite Warlock runes. I don't know. I just... I don't... I do not like the direction that this spec is going. And, um... If there's one thing about me that, like, anybody who's watched my channel for a very long time, Classic or Retail, will know... It's that I am not somebody who goes down with the ship and is like, ah, I'm going to play this, you know, 
build that you know i i don't enjoy just because i'm dedicated to it no if i'm not having fun i'm not gonna play it and i'm also not a meta chaser right so i'm not saying i think i don't even think raw tank's gonna be bad right i think it's still gonna be perfectly good i'm not swapping off it because i don't think it's gonna be meta. i just don't think it's gonna be fun frankly it's better than paladin i can say that with absolute certainty and i just think paladin is going to be more my style same with shaman when i eventually finish leveling that up and i'm even excited to potentially try rogue tank at level 60. I really like the look of some of the stuff that rogues might be getting. They've been in a pretty dire spot for most of Sod so far, but I have hope that some of the 60 stuff will actually make them pretty fun, so I'm kind of curious to try that. But overall, I'm going to play what I think is fun. You know, I, I played Vengeance Demon Hunter through thick and thin in retail, even when it was dog shit. Obviously, it's kind of good now, but now I actually hate it, which is kind of the irony. I played it when it was shit, and now I'm not playing it when it's meta, because the meta play style is pressing two buttons, which, you know, hey, it's just like fucking Sod Warlock. In fact, Sod Warlock has, like, more buttons than Retail Vengeance Demon Hunter. The fucking state of that spec. God. I not believe the way that Blizzard balances classes. It's so shit. At least the Retail team, you know, they should know better. They have years of practice and more developers. Sod, it's like, I can kind of forgive them not wanting to dedicate a ton of time in just one Warlock build, because they have all these other things that they need to tinker with, but I do wish that they, at the very least, explained to us why the fuck they thought killing Soul Link was a good idea. Because it's just fucking stupid. So, we'll see. Wanted to get that rant out there just because, um, I know I'm not the only one who feels that way. I've heard from a lot of people that they are also really pissed off about Soul Link. And I also know I'm not the only one who's considering quitting Lock Tank. A lot of people have said that if Soul Link goes through, they're quitting. And now that they, it's gone through, they're like, fuck this shit. I don't want to play this class anymore. Um... Yeah. Sucks. Uh, but hey, you know, hopefully I'll have more fun than I think I will. Uh, I'm definitely going to have fun leveling, so, you know, if you're watching this right around when the time it comes out, check out my live stream, and depending on when I post this, it's probably going to be about, like, five hours from the time I post this. Or check out the live stream leveling recording, I guess. Uh, and now I need to make a video from scratch. Fuck. <laughs> I am so screwed. Anyways, hope you enjoyed watching. Peace.